There's a lot happening in this country. Good morning and welcome to the AM show where we get into the various news stories that matter to you and then analyze, analyze the stories or the issues that resonate with all of us. Today, Denise Yapomeje will start by serving you the first news bulletin of the day and then we get into our news review segment. Dr. Paul Grebwachi Dankwa, government spokesperson of um, security and governance, and Nanayal Sapong, political assistant to Alan Shamanting, will both be joining us to get into the newspaper review. And then we've turned up Bilal Abdullah, we'll bring you AM Sports. And then our big stories begin. We'll start from the West African Examination Council, who are set to consider the deployment of private invigilators as 18 teacher invigilators are arrested three days into the BCE examination for malpractice. But YX says the integrity of the exercise is intact. How do we navigate this existential challenge of examination malpractice? We will discuss the issues. And today being a Thursday, we'll bring you AM exclusive. And today, Benjamin Akaku engages His Excellency Ishad Razali, the European ambassador, the European Union ambassador rather, to Ghana on a wide range of issues. And you don't want to miss that conversation. These and many more coming your way on the AM show. My name is Sweetie Abochi. Let's start with the AM news. Good morning. My name is Denise Yapomaeje and I'm back to bring you AM News. Now, it's been two days since he was outdoored as NPP running mate to NPP flag bearer Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. But already, Energy Minister Dr. Matthew Puku Prempe is on the defensive after sparking controversy. He claimed at his unveiling rally that not even Ghana's founding president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, had achieved more than the current president, Nane Kufuado. He claimed President Ekufuado's achievements are unmatched in Ghana's post-independence era. Those comments have triggered a storm, attracting sharp criticism from a section of the public. Dr. Opoku Prempe has himself been defending his comments on a tour of the Western region. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Our politics is done in every four years, and you have supported Nanado to do whatever he has been able to do as president. Unfortunately, when I said it, I have been misunderstood since 1957 till today, from Kwame Nkrumah's time. No government has performed better than Nanado's. But it looks as though in our body politics today, hmm, when you speak the truth, they say you are arrogant, but we hail you when you tell lies. I'm your son, I'm your grandson. You didn't instill in me fear and lies. <laughs> Well, away from Napu and the Nkoma controversy, the minority in Parliament say they cannot understand how the government will be asking Parliament to approve $250 million at a time when it is asking its debtors to forgive or postpone the repayment of its debts. According to former Majority Leader Oseche Mensambun, so the loan is for the Ghana Financial Stability Project. There's more in the following report by Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent Kweku Asante. 
Ghana is in the process of finalizing its arrangement with external creditors to restructure its debt. But at the same time, more loans are coming to parliament for approval. In fact, in the last few sittings of parliament, they have approved 150 million that the minority opposed to for greater Accra resilience projects. Today on the other paper, a new $250 million loan has been programmed and referred to the Finance Committee. The minority say this clearly shows that the government is not intent on taking Ghana out of its debt distress position. Listen to Governor Kwame Agboja make a spirited argument against this loan agreement even before the Finance Committee will present a report to the House. This actually goes to the heart of almost every problem we have currently as a country over borrowing. When we have borrowed up to our neck, we can't pay. We are going around the world begging everybody to forgive us our loans. At the same time, we are borrowing more. We have gone everywhere. China was last week borrowing, telling China that forgive us part of what we, we borrowed. And then on Wednesday morning, you are borrowing more. How do you, how do you solve your borrowing problem by borrowing more? I don't get it. And I'm saying that the finance minister better answer that question. Don't take that responsibility. Because it's a dangerous trap for you. In fact, once upon a time you presented a budget here, that year was better. The year that the finance minister came, things went bad. But they could have made you a finance minister. They refused not to, uh, they, they refused to make you a finance minister. Don't take up the responsibility of borrowing extra money to, I mean, hurt the economy. Former minority leader Harun Idrisu is concerned that this loan agreement, if it goes through, may be against the current IMF program that Ghana is under. Mr. Speaker, I will know whether he is aware that Ghana, as part of its agreement with the IMF, between now and even end of 2025, cannot borrow more than 250 million US dollars non-concessionary loan. So if he's laying this, what he needs to clarify is whether maybe this came earlier before part of the creditors' agreement the minister reached last week with the IMF. Ghana from now, even for 2025, maximum, Ghana can only borrow non-concessionary up to 250 million US dollars. Former Majority Leader Osei Chairman Sabunsu and Minister for Parliamentary Affairs Osei Chairman Sabunsu explain exactly what this loan is for. He was the one who laid this loan agreement on the floor on behalf of the finance minister. $250 million facility is a financing agreement between the government of Ghana and the IDA, the International Development Association of the World Bank. And Speaker, it is for Ghana's financial stability project. Speaker, it's a critical note in the um, restructuring that government has embarked on. And that agreement, the discussion with the World Bank IMF group, preparatory to where we are today, was really, it was... <laughs> the speaker, so it was part of the uh, discourse that we engaged in. So that is what we're supposed to do, to create, to solidify the platform for us. Thank you very much. This loan agreement has now been referred to the Finance Committee of Parliament. They are expected to work on it, present a report to the House. Already the minority are making their plans known that they may oppose this because they do not accept that government will continue to borrow. Again, about 12.7 million euros in new tax waivers has also now been referred to the tax waivers, despite about $350 million of such tax waivers having been locked up at the Finance Committee. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. And from Parliament, let's head to the courts, because the Supreme Court on Wednesday dismissed an application by activist Oliver Baka Vomawo, which sought to invoke the jurisdiction of the Apex Courts to compel the National Security Minister, Albert Kandapa, to answer some 17 questions in an ongoing defamation case at the High Court. 
Albert Kandapa, who has brought a 10 million CD defamation suit against Oliver Bakavomao over some allegations by the activist, refused to respond to the 17 questions put to him by the plaintiff at the High Court. Legal Affairs Correspondent Latif Idri sat through proceedings and has the rest of the report. The substantive defamation case may be at the High Court, but Oliver Bakavomao, through his lawyers, went to the apex court because the national security minister albert kandapa refused to answer some 17 questions at the high court <laughs> citing national security confidentiality and oath of secrecy oliver baka vomawa and his lawyers were hoping to invoke the jurisdiction of the supreme court to compel the minister to answer those questions which they argued would bring clarity to the case at the high court Dr. Justice Srem Sai, in his legal argument, quoted Order 23 of CI 47 in furtherance of his argument that the Supreme Court compels the National Security Minister to produce documents. Making his legal argument, Bright Otria Jakub, who represented the National Security Minister, posited that the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court was not properly invoked by the plaintiff. He also referenced Article 135 of the 1992 Constitution and argued that the plaintiff failed to reference specific official documents they wanted the court to compel the National Security Minister to produce. He thus prayed the court to dismiss the application because the plaintiff is, quote, on a fishing expedition. In the view of the court, the question put to the National Security Minister by Oliver Baca Vomo through his lawyers are, quote, questions thrown at large without date and time. Chief Justice Gertrude Tokonu, in explaining the difficulty the court had with the application, pointed out that even if the court agreed and granted the application, it was going to be difficult in crafting the order and inquired why the plaintiff came to the Supreme Court under Article 135 but failed to state the specific official documents they wanted to be disclosed by the respondent. Delivering the ruling, the Chief Justice said, quote, after considering the application, the court sees no reference to identifiable documents and thus dismissed the application she described as unsupported. The activist Oliver Baka Vama was still insist that the National Security Minister Albert Kandapa offered him a one million United States dollars bribe and threatened him that if he declined, he was going to use national security apparatus to come after him and persecute him. Mr. Kandapa claimed that he was acting on behalf of the authority of the state when he offered me one million dollars. He claimed that if I did not accept the money, that he was going to use official apparatus of the intelligence agencies to come after me and face the country. Our questions are clear. Did at any point the National Security Council authorize Mr. Kandapa to engage in any of the actions he has engaged in? One, persecuting me, one, offering me money. He refused to answer those questions claiming official secret. The court, the court said you didn't specifically state a particular document that well, should be we, produced. If you, ask the, if you ask the court, if you ask the court, did cabinet make a decision? What are we referring to? How would cabinet's decision be evidenced? By minutes of cabinet. So if the court wants us to say by the minutes, we'll say that. I mean, it, doesn't, it only prolongs a matter that we want to put to bed. Now that the case here at the Supreme Court has been cleared, it now makes way for the defamation case itself at the High Court to continue. From the Supreme Court, this is Latif Idris reporting for Joy News. Well, moving on, a research conducted by the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ISE, a semi-autonomous institute at the University of Ghana, shows an increase in malnutrition in the northern region. The research said while the national average stands at 20%, that of northern region is 30%. Presented the findings at a workshop in Tamale, a researcher at ISE, Dr. Fidelia Dake, said, while some regions have seen some improvement, the situation in the northern region has worsened. The research conducted by the ISSER shows that one in five children in the northern region 
are malnourished, something the researchers say is a cause for worry. Dr. Fidelia Dake said malnutrition is not only a problem on its own, but also affects the cognitive development of the children. For Ghana as a whole, our stunted prevalence is at about 20%, but in northern region alone, it goes as high as 30%. So there's a lot more disadvantage going on there. And that is not even the worst part. We realize that how some regions have improved between 2010 and 2014, the situation has actually worsened in the northern region. So it's not that it's only higher, but it's getting worse by the day. These figures do tell us that we do have a problem of malnutrition on our hands. And malnutrition is not only a problem on its own, but it also affects children in terms of their cognitive development, children who are malnourished are also likely to be malnourished adults. Dean at the School of Graduate Studies at the University of Ghana, Professor Robert Darkmoff Ose said, what accounts for this is lack of knowledge and poverty. He said their interest in the research is to find a cost-effective way to change behavior that will impact positively on the national health and sanitation of the people. Sometimes I believe that part of it is um, knowledge. Um, the other part could be essentially um, the general welfare of the people. So essentially, what our interest was was to try and understand whether there are cost-effective ways of changing behavior in a way that impacts positively on nutrition, health, and sanitation outcomes. Okay, so again, the literature points us to the fact that behavior change is a critical part of changing nutrition outcomes. And so the question then was that how then do we change behavior in the way that will translate into positive nutrition outcomes. So that was our starting point. So we asked ourselves the question, with the technology platforms that are available today, can we explore any of them to see if we can actually leverage them to transmit the messages that households need to hear? And they don't need to hear it once. They need to hear over and over and over again so it becomes part of them. That is the way to change behavior. And that is why we thought we would explore the digital uh, technology or the platform that we used. And generally our results are showing that behavior is actually changing. So if you take those who we actually sent the messages to relative to those who we did not send the messages to, before the messages were sent, they had similar characteristics in terms of the indicators of interest. First, six months after the experimentation, we do find that behavior was beginning to change in a positive way. A mother and a nutrition advocate, Nadia Aliu, said most mothers are unable to provide nutritious foods for their children leading to malnutrition. Our mothers in the cities are too busy. We are not able to provide nutritional food at home for our children. We are busy with the Indomies. We are busy with the calipos, the Coke, and the sodas. By then, we, we have our traditional food that are more nutritious and more balanced. Yet you see a child in Kumbungu, you think he's more malnutritious, malnourished than my child who is at home, who is 10 years, who is equal my age. But it's all because we are not feeding them properly. Now, the executive director of the Community Development Alliance, Salifu Isifu Kanton, has emphasized that security is a shared responsibility and is advocating a shift from policing for the people to policing with the people. Speaking at the Upper West Regional Multi-Stakeholder Peace and Security Conference in WA, Kanton highlighted that this approach would make every citizen of Ghana more security conscious and willing to assist security agencies in preventing and mitigating crimes. Join News's Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafik Salam reports from WA.
the two-day regional multi-stakeholder peace and security conference is championed by the regional network of women renewed in the Upper West region. The conference was on the team building sustainable peace and security, a shared responsibility, leveraging local partnership. It aimed to build consensus among district and regional stakeholders and experts working on peace and security, deepening local cooperation and collaboration as the best way to address local instability factors between individuals, groups, and communities within the region. In November 2023, the Community Development Alliance, CDA, Ghana, with support from USAID, was in the Toros Regional Initiative, launched a six-month-long activity titled Strengthening the Regional Network of Women Renew in Peace Building in the Upper West Region. Under the Renew Activity, CDA Ghana trained and mentored 170 selected women leaders across the 11 municipal and district assemblies in the region on advanced PBE, conflict resolution, peace building, fundraising, and communication. At the sidelines of the conference, the executive director of the Community Development Alliance, Salafu Isubukantong, advocated for a shift from policing for the people to policing with the people. The conference also highlights one thing, that security is a collective responsibility. It is not only the duty of the police to provide security for us. It is not only the job of the military to ensure that we are saved. It is our collective responsibility. And we believe that it is about time we move away from policing for the people to what we call policing with the people. Isi Bukanto also stressed the importance of peace, saying it is priceless. Why? Because peace is a priceless asset. It is the most valuable thing. Without peace and security, we can't be here. The journalists will only be reporting incidents of dead bodies, how people are bombarded and killed, or how people are massacred. So peace is the most priceless thing that we cherish most. Without it, nothing can happen. Without it, we cannot go to farm. Without it, we can't go to school. Without it, the hospitals can't operate. Without it, government institutions cannot work. Without it, we can't even move around. So peace is something that we can't trade with. A senior lecturer at the SDD Dombo University of Business and Integrated Development Studies, Professor Elijah Yandao, who was a keynote speaker, noted that effective policies should focus on border security to address the threats of migration. Strengthening the capacity of law enforcement agencies, as I indicated earlier, to combat border crimes, human trafficking and smuggling is also crucial in safeguarding our internal security. <laughs> Furthermore, fostering cultural exchange and understanding through community initiatives and public awareness campaigns can enhance social harmony and reduce tensions between locals and migrants. Reporting for the news, Rafiq Salam. Well, up next is Business Updates with Benjamin Akafu. Thanks for staying for our business update uh, for you to this morning. And a uh, member of parliament for Boku Central is set to lead the minority in parliament to demonstrate against the Bank of Ghana on the 30th of July, 2024. This was contained in the letter to the Great Accra Regional Police Commander seen by Joy Business. There's more in this report. Member of Parliament for Boku Central, Mahama Yariga, in a letter alleged that they are embarking on this action over what he described as wasteful expenditure by the Bank of Ghana. The Member of Parliament argues that his action was also influenced by rising costs of the new Bank of Ghana's headquarters, which has gone up significantly from the original cost. Mr. Yariga also alleges that the bank is putting up new house for the governor at the cost of $40 million which the bank has refused when the minority requested for some information. The Member of Parliament also raised concerns about the bank embarking on some actions without Parliament's approval. Now, the Bank of Ghana is set to sanction persons or companies who issue checks without the corresponding sums of money in their accounts. Speaking with Joy Business, 
head of credit reporting uh, unit of the Financial Stability Department at the Central Bank, Gottfried Cujo, says such acts attract a ban from access to any credit facility within the financial sector. If you do not have any money in your account, you do not issue a check to somebody. Now, we've seen it happening so much, and so people are losing confidence in their checking system. And so today, you go and buy something, you issue a check, and they'll tell you that, well, uh, unless the check is cleared before you can come for the goods, or some, some companies will not even accept it, because people issue checks when they don't have money, and that's what we refer to as that check. Now, be, because of that, bank, the Bank of Ghana put in quite a number of measures. We have made a lot of noise about it, that if you issue a that check on three occasions, uh, within a year, Bank of Ghana will sanction you. And some of the sanctions uh, uh, include the fact that we would withdraw your checkbooks. You may not be able to issue check again. And another punitive action, uh, that is you will not be able to have access to any credit facility within the banking sector. And we've made so much noise about this. The banks have also tried their best uh, to let people know. But we continue to see that. And I have to tell you that uh, the bank has just recently sanctioned quite a number of people. And, uh, and, and, and we know that <clears throat> this is something that we need the public to be aware of, especially for businesses. If the Bank of Ghana says that you are not going to, you are not going to be allowed to issue a check, then obviously uh, that is something that will affect your business. And if we are not going to allow you to have credit uh, within the industry, that's also something that will affect your business. And so let's all be guided. Do not issue a check when you do not have money in your account. And that's it for our business updates uh, for this morning. And I'm handing over back to, you know whom, Denisia Poma Ej. Hi, Benjamin. Thank you for bringing us business updates. Well, my name is Denisia Poma Ej. That's it for AM News. But up next is the news review. And we'll be joined by Dr. Paul Griff Bwachidankwa. He's government spokesperson on security and governance. Enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs> Many thanks for your company. This is the News Review segment, and it's always brought to you by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. They're offering free fertility screening and free prostate screening at their various branches. Here in Accra, you can find them on the Springtex Road opposite the Shell Sign Board in Kumasi Kronumabuenia behind the Angel Educational Complex, in Takrade and Naji Estates in Tema, Community 22, in Techiman Hanswa in, in Zima, in Siama in Zima. You can call them on 0244 867 068 or 0274 234 Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. The End to Chronic Disease. This morning, my guest is Dr. Paul Grief, Wachidankwa, government spokesperson on security and governance. In the course of the conversation, perhaps we have a second guest join us, but Dr. Paul Grief, Wachidankwa, it's good to have you. Good morning. Okay, how you are you good. feeling? I'm Thank well. You. I'm well. Thank right. you so much. Um, you have a minute or two to get into anything that's um, occupying the most space in your mind this morning. Well, I What's think that I've been, I've been doing a study on the life of David. Oh, okay. Who was king of Israel. And I, You're going biblical today. Well, very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I've just been seeing that David was a man who was very disciplined, a man who... Even his father, Jesse, when um, they were looking for one to be king of Israel, didn't consider that David would be the one that would be chosen by the Lord mm. because he was standing after the Lord's sheep. Mm. And uh, for me this morning, um, I'm akin to the life and character of David, who was a king of Israel, who despite all the odds that were against him, God still said he was a man after his own heart. Mm. And um, I'm reminded that that is an election year. <laughs> and in, in that regard as well, that the Ghanaian people will be minded to deepen their relationship with the Lord in terms mm. of a vertical relationship mm. and a horizontal relationship between human beings. Right. And in that regard, choose a leader who we believe is best fit um, to lead this country. Thank you for those thoughts. It, it leaves you with a lot to, to think through. Absolutely. David... Okay. Are you in any way comparing your chosen um, people on your ticket with David 
In any way, I'm just curious. <laughs> Are you saying that Napo or Dr. Baumia both wax in lyrical these days? Well, you know... Which of them is David in this case? No, well, you see, sweetie, it's, it's very difficult for me from a theological point of view to... Mm. Um, bring context of this. No, but where you, the way you started, into, very beautifully no, no, crafted. No, I'll, I'll, I'll mean, tell you. Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you the truth. I, I am definitely an MPP person. I'm definitely an avowed follower of um, Al Haji Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, his principles, um, his ideologies, um, the empathy that he brings on board, um, the new horizon of digitalization. Mm. I, I believe that where we have got into in the world, we need very transparent, honest, decisive leaders. Is that who, what he is? Absolutely, absolutely. And Benjamin until, said to sing until, a song for you. Oh, yeah, until, until, <laughs> until, until you have encountered, until you have encountered an individual, you, there's not, there's not much right. that you okay. can say um, mm. of the negatives. But I, okay. I hope and pray that the Ghanaian people will take their time in analyzing the vision that we are putting out, um, analyzing the prospects of the future okay. that we have. Okay and be able to make a very good decision All right. for us. On the front page this morning of the Daily Guide, it says, Balmia Napo hates road running. But before we even get into the story, Balmia, um, Napo has been saying a lot of things. Yesterday, he came under a lot of attack, and he defended some of the things that he's been saying. I want to understand from your view, what do you make of it? Do you think that we're just being too hard on this man, or is he not getting the message that we, we as his people receiving his messages, are putting across to him? Let me greet your viewing public, and I'm, I'm told that all politics is local, so let me greet my twin constituency, uh, Ibuaka North constituency and Ibuaka South constituency. Mm. Greet my MP, the Honorable Gifty Chumampofo, and greet the Ibuaka South MP, mm. the Honorable Atachia. And um, really to state that I, I believe in leadership. I believe that leadership is successive. I believe that leaders must do more. I am of the view that if leaders don't do more, then there's no reason to give leaders an opportunity. And so in comparison to Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, whom many people feel that he shouldn't be touched, um, you need to put it in context. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's regime from 1957, pre-colonial, immediately after post-colonial, when the Queen was um, leading the country during that period before we got into our first republic from 1960, 1961, the population of Ghana was about 5 million people. I mean, obviously, um, there was a lot more that he did which uh, many people are benefiting from. But you expect that leaders do more, which is why post-Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Buzia has done more, Echampon has done more, President Kufu has yeah, done more, yeah. Rollins I, I, has I, done I, more. I get your chill of thoughts, but more. I want and you so, to make it brief. Are you saying, are you brief. defending? No, okay. no, I'm not defending. Okay. I'm putting it in context okay. that leaders do more. Mm. And in leaders doing more, leaders have done more. If, if President Kufu has not done more, if Jonathan Mills has not done more, if Mahama has not done more, if President Anadu Danko Ekufuadu has not done more, then there's no need for all of us to be so here. So he's done more than... A he, absolutely. President Ekufuadu Ab has done more than Nkrumah. Ab absolutely. I'll President leave that Anadu for our, our audience to judge. Let's, 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 let's get into the papers. I mean, I'm sure you'll be reading some of the comments have, that have come I up. Have, Even under his own post saying he's grateful for... I was on Twitter yesterday and I, I mean, it gave me a field day. I, but let's get into the papers. Um, on the free SHS, give me my stone. That is Nande Kufuado saying that. Baumia Napo hates road running. You've made Tema safe. Mankralo to IGP. Tetra Core Energy to launch Ghana's first CNG mother station. Minority security recruitment claims are false. That is according to the majority. Let's get into the papers. Um, I'll, obviously, I'll start with the banner story about Napo and Baumia hitting the road running. The 2024 presidential candidate of the New Patriotic Party yesterday commenced a five-day tour of the five northern regions. Dr. Baumia was in Kumase, the Shanti regional capital, on Tuesday to introduce his running mate, Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe. And he then commenced a five-day tour starting from the northeast region, dubbed Community Connect, by visiting Nalerugu Gambaga constituency and thereafter storming the Union and Bankurubu constituencies respectively. And today he will storm the Sheproni, uh, Saboba and Minon constituencies as well and proceed to, well, he's touring the, the, the northern region. And I'm sure his message is that they, um, they want to break the eight. They are, pro they are professing bold solutions for the, the future. The message... And that includes, that includes, <laughs> that includes comparing the president of Kuvado to all the presidents that we've had so far and saying that he was raised not to be, um, not to be um, 
a coward, you know? So no, no. he's not afraid so, so. to speak the truth. So what he's saying is the truth. I, I've been very um, stingy with my opinion and thoughts on all this so far because I just find it a bit funny. I think that the utterances of these presidential candidates in no small way depict how they see the voting population. So if you're saying these things to us, you actually believe us to, you actually believe that we'll hear you and think that, oh, he's saying something um, wise and sensible. What he's saying is the truth. But we are descending people. Paul Grave. Sweetie, unless, of course, we don't want to be very honest and truthful. You and cannot can, look at the I things happening. No, look, no, you just no, gave me context. No, just, and this is, this is just a conversation, yes, right? I, I agree. Okay. And, and, the context and I think, you gave me. I think the context is important. Mm. So okay, so let me give you some context right now. Leaders do eight years in Eight years in power. What one thing? Don't mention free SHS because that's under so much controversy, review, you know, passing it into law. Let's talk about roads. Let's talk about unemployment or underemployment. Let's talk about the energy sector. Let's talk about food security. Let's talk about inflation. What exactly has this government done that really works? We can even talk about health sector. We know what's going on with kidney dialysis the, 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 and all that. What has this President Okufuado Baumia government done that supersedes the work of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah? You know, and you cannot anybody, say that in the... I'll in, tell you something. Mm. Anybody who thinks that Dr. Kwame Nkrumah has done more than all successive governments mm. is living in the past history. Mm. Anybody. Anybody. Because that's why I said, I, I premise my debate and conversation on the fact that in 1957, Ghana's population was about 5 million people. Obviously, there were not a lot of developments as we see today. Post-1957 till now, um, 2024, we are entering a population of about 34 million people with great needs, with great desires, with great aspirations. And so very certainly leaders do more and leaders must do more. If the work we, of we Nkrumah... Cannot, we cannot live right. in the past right. and hold on to past glories and expect that those past glories will continue to live on even when we have appointed leaders. Which is why when we appoint leaders, leaders come with a vision. They share their policies, and those policies are implemented in government, should they be voted into office. Okay. And, and now, so I think that we need to put it in context. And there's no, there's no vilification of the fact that Nkrumah hasn't done well. President Nkrumah has done extremely well. You know that some countries, He's some democracies study, study, study Nkrumah, study I, I, his I don't, legacy. I don't doubt they, that. Yeah. I so don't what, doubt what that. what have you taken from the works or the life or the legacy of Nkrumah that you are applying in this current government or this administration that you think didn't all go well for you and so you can confidently say that no, this government see, is doing much it, more than everything the, that Nkrumah has or no, his ideas the, that he's the, written down perspective, for us I think it's the perspective of the argument and the light within which people want to view it. Okay. okay. Nobody disappreciates what Nkrumah has done. Nkrumah has done extremely well. And I've always stated that before Nkrumah were a collective of people who felt that so Ghana was ready. It's a numbers game then. A absolutely. <laughs> people who were ready, people felt that, yes, Ghana was ready for independence. And I've stated that on the 4th of August 1947, when Dr. J.B. Dankwa said that Ghana was ready for independence and prepared a 10-year journey, for us to be able to gain our independence, a collective decision by both men and women who fought for the liberation of this country. And so no one rules out the fact that Nkrumah was singled out to lead Ghana and lead the, the government delegation at the time to be able to negotiate with the British colony. Nobody rules that out. But all I'm saying, all I'm saying is that post Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, We've gone through the First Republic, we've gone through the Second Republic, we've had military junctures, we've gone through the Third Republic, we're in the Fourth Republic. Every single leader has had to contribute significantly upon the foundations which were set. Exactly. So exactly. the work that Nkrumah did with 5 million population and what Ekufado is doing with 30 million population, that is the comparison you're making. That's uh, you, it. Between the 5 million and the 30 something million. Absolutely. That is, by that comparison, he's done more. Point, point taken. Exactly. Point Thank noted. you. Now, Let's you, you move. talk no, about... We do have to get into the pictures. Okay, so. I'll come back to you. So, Misha South NPP race, Napo's brother picks number one. That's the... Um, the nominations are... I think they filed nominations two days ago. Yes. So, five people filed and... Um, Napo's brother picks number one. Let's see how that goes for him. On a free SHS, give me my stone. That is President Ekufuado. I'll just rush through the papers and then we'll do three major stories and then I'll come to you. President Ekufuado has urged John Mahama, the NDC flag bearer, to acknowledge his role in introducing the free SHS policy. He pointed out that when he initially proposed a free SH policy, then Mahama criticized the idea. However, now he seeks to claim it as his initiative. All right. 
Israel military tells Gaza City residents to leave. That is on the international front. Ethiopian PM meets Sudan army chief in push for peace and security. 12 school children, driver killed in a crash. Um, that's at, let me get into that story briefly. At least 12 school children and drivers and one driver of their minibus were killed in a road crash in South Africa's oh, Gauteng province as they were going to school. Local officials said on Wednesday, seven other children were brought to a hospital for treatment. Our condolences to those children and the families of um, all those involved. Government clears all medical supplies at the ports. This is the Global Fund medic uh, medical supplies that has been at the ports for over a year. After enduring a prolonged bureaucratic stalemate at the Tema port, the government has finally managed to clear all medical supplies that has been stuck for over a year. The persistent delay surrounding the clearance of these crucial medical provisions, generously donated by Global Fund, has sparked widespread concerns among stakeholders and parliamentary members. Acknowledging the mountain pressure, the government recently took decisive steps to address the long-standing issue. Do you think that if Ghanaians didn't come out and make as much noise about this as we did, we'd get to the point where these med medical supplies are finally left the port. Oh, no, what, I, is your, I, what is your... I, 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 I feel that um, medicine is important, um, equipment are important, and the number of hospitals that needs to be equipped very well. Um, my own constituency has just received um, an additional x-ray um, at, the, at the new TAFO um, government hospital mm. and so we are glad that at least government comes to the aid of ensuring that these medical equipments are cleared it's yeah. key i mean people bring in uh, medical equipments into the country and it must be used for the health infrastructure of the country so i'm glad i'm very happy too I'm, because I'm um i mean these medical supplies need to be used for the reasons why they were donated to so, us and not just um lying at the pots and rotting Yolo actor referred for treatment abroad, use courts, not police, for defamation cases. That is on the entertainment front. Let's support women in agribusiness. Tetra Core Energy to launch Ghana's first CNJ mother station. Cocoa Board to roll out data management system. Let me get into this story. The Ghana Cocoa Board will soon roll out a new cocoa management system to help boost the operations and improve relations among stakeholders in the cocoa value chain. Chief Executive of Cocoa Board, Joseph Boahineju, who disclosed this during a field trip with journalists at this in the central region, said the new database contains all farmer households and farms in polygon maps, which will enable Cocoa Board track and become abreast with activities of farmers across the country. Uh, this is all, you know, efforts toward digitalizing various sectors of our economy. So, I mean, if this is what we need to track and be efficient with the work we do at Cocoa Board, I really, it comes as good news to me. But let me introduce my second guest this morning, Nanaya Sapong, um, political assistant to Alan Chermanteng of the Alliance for Revolutionary Change. And I see you came with your great transformational plan yes. in hand. Yes. Good morning. It's like a Bible now. Good morning. Although you are late, I'll still give you a minute to um, get into your, your thoughts before we continue with the papers. What's on your mind? Actually, when I was coming, I was monitoring, and there was this advert on non-communicable diseases. And I think that it's important that we all add our voices, you know, because it's non-communicable and because those who have it are not able to complain or come out to speak about it, you will notice that um, they die in silence. And it's like they are neglected. So we should have, I think it's good, that there's been a call for a national dialogue. Let's all look into it. If, if there are ways we can all help fight it, because this, this mostly, I, I call them the expensive diseases. Mm. They're the expensive Imagine diseases. needing 3,500 CDs a month just to live in this economy. In this economy <laughs> where uh, we are not able to put on belts, but suspenders. Right. Um, I watched a documentary and the girl was saying that sometimes they have, she's tired of calling people every time so they can get money just to go to the hospital. And sometimes they have the money to go, but they don't even have transportation. It's, it's embarrassing. It's, it's, when you would have to yeah. make a call. Yeah. Almost, you know, some are monthly, some are weekly. You know, when every week you are not rather thinking about what to eat. Or to drink, but that rather, becomes a luxury, you know. You know, what the you medication, 
rather becomes the everyday sin. You know, the, mm. the, you know I think um, uh, they, should, they should all add your voices. To Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, saw, I, saw, I saw the conversations on NCD. Um, is very key mm. for, for us to ensure that we um, extend the right hand of embracing um, onto them. Because I, I've, always, I've always been a proponent of human life. Yeah. That, um, human lives matter. You always don't have an opportunity to come back again when you are extinct. Yes. Mm. The best we can do is to make sure that we support in the manner in which we can. Redo, Redo, who said, we know how to bring the economy back, but we don't know how to bring the people back during yes, COVID. No, 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 no. <laughs> the economy is not back yet. The economy is back. Ah, uh, boy. Has Gentlemen, let's get into the papers. So I was just reading the story about Cocoa Board to, set to roll out a new digital system to onboard cocoa farmers you know, to be able to track where these farms are in their households for efficiency. Then I'll take your thoughts on that, then I'll go to Paul. I, I think that it's hard time Cocoa Board has got absolute data on, on the cocoa farms. Mm. And when I saw the story this morning, then I asked myself, so if they do not have these data, then they still have a budget to go do what we call the cocoa spraying exercises and you know, tree planting in all of these areas. Then I ask myself, where do they go to do it? Data is very important. But more importantly is how the finances of Cocoa Board has been managed. I think that those who are not even farmers are benefiting more than those who are the actual farmers and are actually feeding the nation. We right. should be able to um, properly draw the lines between the farming the financing of cocoa and the other activities that comes with cocoa. Okay. They should be seen doing more of the research, more of the farming um, and separated from the trading aspect of cocoa. I see them more interested in the trading aspect and whether trading or the main agricultural activity, they need data to be able to. It's a good call. Um, I just hope okay. that it's something that we are able to hold and, and work with. Okay, Paul Grave. Yes, so I have seen that Cocoa Board is doing what many African countries are not doing. To be able to pin the cocoa tree, the cocoa farmer, the cocoa pod, would be able to bring effective transformation. And I, I listened to the CEO on Asempa when he, he spoke about it very clearly. And, you know, the lighter side of this is that in 1957, this was not. Paul, we existed. don't have to do this. I don't have to, you, but you really I, don't I, I don't have to. I don't have to, but no, I don't, I don't, no, I don't have to. But I just want you to know. You understand? I'm bringing it to. I'm bringing it to your forefront. Okay, just for you to be able to know that leaders do more, and that's what everybody expects leaders to do. And, and, and the comparison it's, it's is It's a really... question of evolution exactly. and civilization exactly. and what and, was available and then and what, innovation absolutely. and what was available Ab then absolutely. and what's available absolutely. now. Absolutely, absolutely. But it just brings to mind. But we must commend um, Cocoa Board for bringing this um, digital transformation within the cocoa industry. And I think that every single farmer will be happy. Thereby, okay. when you have challenges, and I'm told that the data is there, when your cocoa pod is not performing very well and cocoa tree is not performing very well, we can locate it. And the good news as well is that when the cocoa is sold, we can also be able to locate the farm it is coming from in that process. And okay. that's, that's a lot more. There's about. another story here about Napo is not arrogant, according to Tum. And although we've gotten into the story already, I want to know what you think, Nanaya Osapo. What is the position of the Alliance for Revolutionary Change in terms of the things that um, running mates for the NPP has been saying? The comparison to Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and many other things. What say you? First of all, I think that um, Napo was a bit more, I, I want to be careful with it, my choice of words, but that was more of an irresponsible statement to have, you know, not the comparison, but the statement the context in which the comparison was done. Um, there has been issues between the NPP and the Nkrumahs, which His Excellency, the former, for which His Excellency, the former president, actually, President Kufo, during his tenure, tried to play around it to see how best he can water things. And we've been in a very good relationship with them ever since. You do not use this opportunity that is given you 
to bring back the scars. What Napoleon should have done was rather to have used the opportunity given him his first public speech to give a sense of direction, to give a sense of hope, and to give a sense of restoration. But rather, he used this opportunity to rather do uh, negative propaganda. Mm. And uh, to my surprise, he's actually going around defending the statement. He said he was raised to be honest. Okay, but you, so was then you that, that was told not me, honesty. Just a sec. Was it you that told me that, I think I asked last time we met about the way, the things he's been saying and his responses to the energy crisis and some of the questions, the request for a timetable. And someone said to me that a new NAPO will be revealed or unveiled. So is this statement. the NAPO no, 2.0? I, I don't think 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 I don't this was less than 35 minutes after his <laughs> grandfather had actually advised him not to embarrass him. Yeah. And you see, in their camp tradition, if your grandfather should come into the public domain and say that, I have advised you at home, but for the avoidance of doubt, let me say it for everyone to hear, that indeed, I raised you not to be arrogant. I can say you are not arrogant, but you have the responsibility to prove yourself. And that's a story. 35 minutes yeah. afterwards or so, 40 minutes afterwards, you go to embarrass him. I, he owes Ghanaians an apology. If there is any yeah. president now who, from Kwame Nkrumah's time to date, who has brought in um, policies of transformation, we should be talking about the Kwame Nkrumahs, we should be talking about All the right, presidential right. force. They, you can pinpoint to transformation, industrial transformation policies, things that has direct effect and impact on and the economy. And that gives us energy right now. I go to Mudam and all those things. This Tell my motorway. Way. This then this man. same man, you would refer to him as such. That was anyway, only responsible. So let's move on. Let's but you, some they would stories, actually yeah. defend it. I mean, oh, yeah, 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 yeah I mean, let's... And I will defend it. No, but no I, think, I think we just don't I, I see how they... We, we don't see life as you guys see yeah. it. We, no, I think we, we are just operating context. in two different no, realities. No, it cannot be... Okay. No, it, it's no, two the, different realities. Reality. That, mm, That's what I've said. The reality is that leaders do more. Okay. And you expect that leaders do more. What has your leader done? Of course, you don't know what President Anado Danko Kufuadu has done. You talk about industrialization. Look at the number of factories that we put in. Look at the number of ambulances. Which factories? Look at are you able to speak at, with I, the one I you wanted? I thought you said anything Alan was not... Why, Alan was a member of the government. Okay. Alan Tremantin was a member of so the he government. he performed good. He was a minister under President Anado Danko Kufuadu. So he Kufuadu. did well. The President Anado Danko Kufuadu appointed him as minister in his first term and second term. So... Leader here. So no, but the president has always appointed leaders. We, we, we don't have time for all that. Leaders. So minority security <laughs> recruitment claims are false. That is according to the majority. And this is still the Daily Guide newspaper. I think this is the last story I'll do and we move on to other papers. Majority in parliament has dismissed as untrue the minority's claim that the government intends to recruit 11,000 personnel into their security services. And the NDC MPs had accused the government of engaging in irregular recruitment ahead of the 2024 presidential and parliamentary election led by their deputy leader, Emmanuel Amako Fibwa. Um, the NDC MP said the type of recruitment the government plans to embark upon is fraught with procedural breaches and nepotism. Quote, it would be recalled that the NDC minority raised concerns about similar secret recruitment of NPP foot soldiers, including its thugs, into the security services as part of its election rigging uh, machine for the 2020 general elections, he said. And responding to the allegations, First Deputy Majority Whip Habib Idrisu said, the minority had deliberately distorted the facts to cause political tension. Paul Grave. You know, I've seen, I've seen conversations on uh, recruitment. I've seen headlines um, on recruitment. I, 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 I am concerned to see that the minority would want to bring a lot more political colorization into this because, you see, I don't know, unless someone should tell me that the security personnel are able to aid in the rigging of an election. I don't know. I don't know, unless someone tells me. What I know is that every single But what is the role of security personnel in elections? It's to make sure that you protect the electoral processes. You should make sure that there's peace. 
and um, the right the right protocols are followed. That that's the role I know. So in that's the, the role. I just want to make a point. I want you to make a point, but like follow my my trail of thoughts. So to ensure that the right things are done. So if you have an if you have a polling station packed <coughs> with security personnel from a particular party or sympathizers of a particular party. Is it a possibility that they will stand by and watch the wrong things rather being done? You know, my challenge really with that thought is that you're assuming that the security personnel are from a political or political party. In, when you go to... But there are instances, no, probably, hold on, hold, where... No, no sweetie, yeah. sweetie, let me tell okay. you. When you go to the war school, which is where they train a lot of these security personnel, you are told that for effective peace in your country, you must ensure that there is equal representation of every ethnic group in your security apparatus. Mm -hmm. That's what you are told. Mm -hmm. Because at the war front, I'm wondering why my brother is watching me with oh. much admiration. <laughs> at, the, <laughs> at, the, at the war front, it's important that you have equity of every single ethnic group represented in the, in the security services. I don't want to think that anybody in the security persons is either aligned to the New Patriotic Party or to the NDC or to CPP. I would want to consider that everyone who is given an opportunity to serve in the military, in the police, in the Ghana, in the Ghana forces, in the prisons or fire service is trained equitably, okay, to unlearn certain traditions that you have had. And so no one goes through training and comes out as an MPP policeman or an NDC policeman. It's neither here nor there. Neither that as it may. Is it a possibility that the processes and costs involved in getting into these security agencies require you to know someone big in power or, you know, a political figure so that they can help you get into the agency? I, I don't think so. I, 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 I know people who right. generally are able to apply and get, and get access into into the, any of the security So there are no instances where there's a particular number reserved none, none for people in power none. to feed the, none these agencies with their, you know, their None, none that I'm All right. None that I'm aware. None I also We all have to be honest. Okay. In our lives. Sometimes. You just have to be honest. You and I go, you and I go out there, we hear. And trust me, there is no smoke without fire. Mm. The, it can't be always said, and you tell me that there is no art of truth. We have to deal with the matter. Personally, I think that to do recruitment in an electioneering year, and mostly this is how they do it, they do it some few months to the elections. Now, these security officers come out of training, and probably in weeks they are placed in, 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 in election posts. In my view, it's not the best. Now, if you look at our great transformational plan, to deal with this, there is a need. We've stated in the executive part, which has to do with the governance um, um, cluster, that related to appointment of heads of independent constitutional bodies and other public sector entities and the heads of security services, to make the appointment of the said officers by the president mm. subject to approval by the second chamber. You know, we said we would abolish the Council of State and bring what we call the second chamber. Now, to establish this in place, you know, so that they have a voice. If we have people who have really been scrutinized and are not in position as heads of security based on their political affiliations, mm purported political affiliations, mm. which, I mean, the ordinary Ghanaian thinks otherwise. Then we will see this happening. Okay. So what I think about this is that it appears, and also you can argue that it's because the NDC is in opposition, but they, they seem to be punching a lot of loopholes. But that has in been, some of the, that has the, been the, it. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, bill, the activities leading up to election 2024, there was that missing VVR case that they made a national issue. Then there was the, you know, Sweetie. rising up against abolishing the indelible ink. When then there MPP, was the moving the dates from November, when, December to when November. When MPP was in opposition. And now it's recruitment and when it's MPP, packing the Supreme Court with justices. When MPP was in opposition, it's, it's, yeah? Nana, no, let, me, let me land on my point. It appears that uh. the NDC is punching loopholes in some of the um, activities that this government, and I'm not saying party, the government, you know, is involved in, in a build-up to election 2024. Can you see yeah, that you're, picture? You're that being very speaking? economical. 
But, no, I'm not, the, I'm, but the I'm truth of the matter is. is, when MPP was in opposition, they point holes in everything that led to the elections. But I they do say that it's because the, the, that the, 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 it, it could the electoral be that commission, they attacked the police, mm. they attacked the military. Today, MPP is in government. They are defending everything. See, when you are in government and you are blinded by political colors, you tend to defend every single thing that goes in your favor, that seems to be going to your favor. But so they'll be there. surprised because Ghanaians are tired. Okay. The police, they are also Ghanaians. They go to the market. The electoral commissioner, I said that at least if she doesn't know anything or she's not seen anything, she has a predecessor, uh, um, um, Mr. Dr. Jan, you will stay in office forever. Okay. And so they should, I think when they are in positions, they should think through the fact that it is just but for a time. No, you know Kathleen Adi, chairperson of the NCC. Yes, I do. She says politicians think in four years only. And that statement stuck with me because most of the time, you see developmental works ongoing, days or months to elections. You see people coming out to tell us what we should and should not do or look out for in political figures, days or weeks and months to elections. But that's just my thoughts. Let's get into your papers now, Paul Gray. My papers, the new finder. Um, inflation for June drops to 22.8%. And you say that with such a, smile, a big smile on your face. Talk uh -huh. to me about the month-to-month -month inflation. Government. The comparison between last month and this <laughs> month alone. Well, the, prices. it's dropping. It's dropping. Hmm. It's dropping. Go Government ahead. pilots housing incentives for developers with a state housing corporation. Access banks waste is useful campaign to impact over 150,000 children in schools. And then I find this very interesting. Pressure mounts on police to speed up probe into death of KNUST graduates. And then I think their major banner is 30.7 billion Ghana cities revenue lost in seven years to import tax exemptions and tax waivers granted to companies. And so um, I think that for me, my, my major story, Omni Basic um, Bank gives vehicle to airport police to enhance security. NPA donates quadruple GC MC equipment to Gaia to protect public health. Um, I'll read the pressure that is mounting on the police sure. on the QNDST because I think that's important. So the family of Ms. Louise Abner Quarantine is seeking justice and demanding an answers regarding the circumstances leading to her death on June 7, 2024. They, along with the company she worked for, are urging the Ghana Police Service to release the findings of the preliminary investigations into the death of the 24-year-old Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology graduate. The silence from the police has fueled speculations about a possible cause of Ms. Quarantine's death and its damaging reputations. Compounding the situation, the hotel where she was staying has been unable to provide closed-circuit television footage, which is CCTV, claiming their cameras were not functioning at the time. Mesh Cranston had traveled with a senior colleague and a driver to Takradi in the Western region for a business trip on June 7, 2024, where she met her untimely death following the following day. Reports indicate that she had been in contact with her family during the trip with plans to return home after completing a task and on and on and on. And on. I think this is, this is very important. Um, it would be good for the Ghana Police Service to um, look into this issue and provide answers um, to the family. And um, I'm, I'm sad to hear about the death of Miss Louise Abner Cranton. Um, I think, um, mm. I don't know what led to the cause of death, but I mean, I've always stated that um, human dignity and sanctity is important. And then I have here um, Ghana's urgent drive to meet SDG targets amid rapid population growth. Um, Give Thyself Holy um, 2024 conference with Bishop Dakiwad Mills. Um, I had to read this because I was ordained by Bishop Dak 12 years ago. Oh boy. Um, okay. Just about this time. Um, <laughs> And then I, I but I was that. I was curious about the inflation story. Oh could sure, you, I can I can, I can quickly yeah. I can quickly do that. Mm. So inflation, the year-on-year -year inflation rate slowed to 22.8 percent in June compared to 23.1 percent the previous month. This means that in the month of June, the general price level was 22.8 higher than June 2023. The month-on-month -month inflation between May and June 2024 was 2.9%. Professor Samuel Enin, the government institution at the press briefing, said the consumer price index for June 2024 
226.4 relative to 184.4 for June 2024. He said food inflation was 24% compared to last year's last month food inflation of 22.6%, with the month of month food inflation being about 5.1%. Mm. Meanwhile, non-food inflation has also contributed to about 21.6% compared to last month non-inflation, not food inflation of 23.6%, with the month on month being about 0.9%. All right. Inflation in, uh, for imported, mm. 7.5%. So basically, <laughs> dropped by 2%. Yes, basically, yes. Basically, dropped by 2%. No, but you so see... So we rejoice, every, and you, you every do four realize weeks. that this hasn't really reflected every, yet in every, our pockets, every right? Every four weeks. The same if, price, if we have this going every four weeks, I think that we, we'll be doing better. Every four weeks, if inflation drops 2% or 3%, we'll be doing better okay. by the time we get to December. Sweetie, oh, um, you know, when they come to sit Nanaya. on set and they speak with this level of impunity... <laughs> Nana, how do you call this impunity? Nana, let's, let's, let, let's be... Um, how do you call this impunity? Let's be in 2016, in our... no, it went impunity. Sure, it? sure, sure. I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying just don't go... No, go, no, I'm not go, going go, that go. way. Yeah. Around this time, 2016, we said that the the economy was not being managed well. Inflation around this time was around 17.5%. We campaigned as a party, your party, and we said we could do your better. Your former party. If we are able to do better, and for that reason, Ghanaians gives us power. And around this same time, we are 20 24. 22. 22. 22. 24 was last year, yeah, 24. And we 22. still 22. have the gas mm. to use the then administration as a yastic. Are we not doing Ghanaians a disservice? Mm. Sweetie, can I tell you something? You mm. know, sometimes when I hear these, right, I get very and concerned. And I've, I've, I've stated. Let, let him I've, I've stated. Let me, uh, okay, let then let, me, let, me, let him finish oh, okay, his sure, sure. of thoughts. Yeah. When you are talking about it, they are quick to bring in COVID and Russian-Ukraine war. COVID ended two, three years ago. And we are still paying taxes. Mm. We still pay taxes. Mm. You talk about, if, and you see, when you are talking about the inflation, they are quick to go into the month-to-month -month and the details, which actually is in single digits. Because people who are listening to us or who are watching, and missed the 22.8% would be misinformed by the month to month. This does not reflect when you go to the market. DPRTU is threatening to increase fares. Food is going up every single day. And I always tell, I I tell people, I say, when you put on the suit, and the tie, and you sit behind your desk, you would not understand the economy. But just on a Saturday morning or, a, or a Friday afternoon, just go into the open market and try to buy stuff for the house. All right. We have, we have to go. Paul Grave, so your you, response. I, I, have, I have always advised, and you know, I, I say that my mother used to tell me to go to the market. And go. Oh, not this again. No, okay. it's, it's important. <laughs> so you, think you, would, you, would be, you would be impressed oh. how prices are affordable between the very early hours of the morning. If we all want to wake up early and go to market at dawn, we would have very, very affordable prices. Paul Grave, it's not, about, I, I, it's not about when you go to the market to get affordable prices of goods and services. It's about stable prices for a prolonged period of time so that the money you're making does not keep fluctuating against the it, things you need on then, a daily then basis. Then it's our collective responsibility. To because do there what? are times there are times that the market people raise their prices. Why do you think they do that? There are times. That why, the market, why would the some why would a market why would Which a trader why, there must be equity indulge me? Why would a trader, why would a tomato seller? Sell what she used to sell for five CDs as 10 CDs, do you think? What factors do you think influence that change in prices? Because you said they do that. Why? 
Because obviously the cost that she's getting it at, you know, the, the re retail or so place is gone high. Cost of transporting those items to the market is gone high. She needs to make profit. The services that she herself needs as a person working for some sort of income has increased. And so she needs to be able to make profit. So when you say that, we should go to the market early. Why, why? Before we can get prices at an affordable price. It's almost as if we, we are hurt and we are bleeding, and you're like, oh, just pour water on it, you'll be fine. When the crowd, they say, you, can you can just See, pour water. On when this food. issue about food came up, you notice that they went around doing some videos. You go to a table, you go into a village, you go in a village around that area where they do tomato farming. You meet a farmer by the farm gate. And he tells you that the basket of tomatoes has, let's say, 40 cedars. Then you make a video of it. Then you come and put it out and tell Ghanaians that a basket of tomato is 40 Ghana cedars. So myself and you, who are staying in Accra, we should travel all the way to Chobodom or Atebu Wamantin to go and buy them. I will take. I mean, it's the same final, explanation he's, he's, he's giving us here. We, we let's let's go. let's let's face reality. Let's let's be real with Ghanaians. Charlie, Ghana Edin, I admit that Ghana Edin and Ghana Edin, not just for you, Ghana Edin for me, for Sweetie, and for everybody. And the solution is we and should wake up early. early and go to the oh, market. we should no, wake up I mean, early and it, go to the market. In addition hmm. to that, you see, you, we should ensure. I mean, look at it. Inflation has come down. 22.8 percent. You are happy. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not happy. Have you checked the inflation? Let, let him, let, I'm not happy. Nana, nana, I'll let him, I'm, let I'm him get happy. through his I am and then we, we have to go. I am pleased, really, that, and you see, when you talk about COVID-19, you talk, I've stated that, take COVID-19 out of President Nanado Danko Ekufuado's government, take Russia's invasion of Ukraine out of President Nanado Danko Ekufuado's government, and you realize that in this fourth republic, we have been better managers of the Ghanaian economy. Have you seen our water bodies single, we better managed, digit, managed. We had a single digit inflation from 2017, 2018, 2019. Single digit you inflation. Are only as best, you are only as best as your next performance for a grade. This 2024, July, as we sit here and talk about these issues, you cannot say that because you had a single digit inflation last year or so, two years ago, it means that you're doing very well. But we have to go. I'll give you 30 seconds each to just conclude on everything we've discussed so far. I'll start with you, Nanaya Osapon. I mean, to, to summarize this, I think that Ghanaians are tired. We need a more united government, a government that would be visionary and transformational, that would be real with Ghanaians, a government that would provide us a high level of stability, growth, resilience, and prosperity as a nation. And in my view, if we're going to dwell among this duopoly, they would always come and sit on set and tell our stories as, as we're hearing today. 30 seconds is up. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I can agree and empathize that Ghana is hard. Um, Ghana is difficult. But um, the government of President Anadu Danka Kufuado is addressing those very teeth and challenges. And so for Ghanaians who are struggling on a day-to-day -day basis with inflation, struggling with unemployment, the government is working on those, and uh, we can only ask that you continue to support and assist our government. That was honest, but I don't know about the fact in there. <laughs> it related, <laughs> uh, it related with the dedication going to Stanley Amati Field. I wish you God's abundance blessings in this special day from Auntie Na Oyo of McCarthy Hills. And this is coming through Benjamin to you. Happy birthday, um, Stanley Amate Fio. And that's it for the news review segment on the AM show brought to you by Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. You can stay. Sports is up next. <laughs> Welcome to the sports segment on the AM show. My name is Harun Mubarak. Now, Team Ghana has departed for France to prepare for the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. The team left last night to Paris and will continue to Strasbourg, where they are expected to camp for 11 days before moving to the global to the Games Village in Paris. Now, high jumper Rossi Abua was the only athlete sported 
at the Kotoka International Airport as the remaining seven will join the team from their respective locations. Now, Rose, who won gold at the African Athletics Championships in June, is hopeful of replicating her performance at the Olympic Games. She spoke to Joy Sports editor Fentio Tahiru. Fentio. Qualifying for Olympics is such a great experience and I'm really happy to, I mean, see myself there to, I mean, compete for my country, Ghana. Tell me about your personal target, 1.97, new personal best for you, and you just keep going higher and higher and higher. What is possible for you in Paris? Um, I feel like my target is like, I want to, I mean, jump above 197, like 197 and above, and I know for sure that I'm going to make it because looking at my performance I put up during the NCA, I feel like um, I'll do much better um, since there is, um, there is it's going to be like a competitive among um, ourselves and we, we, know, we already know each other so I mean it's, go, it's really going to be a competitive one so it's really going to push us, I mean, do our best. And Rose, you barely lose everywhere you compete, you win. You won at Mauritius, you won in Accra, you won in China, even NCA for the first time ever a Ghanaian had become NCA champion, a Ghanaian woman had become NCA champion. Paris is waiting for you. What should we expect from you? Oh, I mean, Ghanaians, like I would say, everyone should expect, like, um, expect me qualifying to the finals and, I mean, see myself in the podium. It would be such a great experience if at least I make it to the finals and at least um, get a medal. Um, I actually didn't spend time with my family because um, I was in Cape Coast and I, I was training towards the Olympics because the training that my coach sent to me, um, the one who was supervising was in Cape Coast. So then I have to, I mean, go to Cape Coast and um, train. And due to the training schedule, I can't, I mean, go to Kumasi to see my people or my family. So that's, that's what... Elsewhere, President of Ghana Athletics, Bawa Fuseni, has called on the government to improve efforts in maintaining the Kufuridia Youth Resource Centre. The facility, which was inaugurated in December last year, comprises a FIFA standard football pitch, a nine-lane athletic track, and courts for tennis, basketball, and volleyball. Victor Achutamaklu has more in this report. <music>
enormous because the area of that catchment area, Kofori Dua, who is a part of our central region, that area, they've never had synthetic runners of it there apart from now. So putting it in there, it will accelerate athletic development in the region, not only in Kofori Dua, but those from who they, we can organize a triangular competition between who OT region and Kofori Dua to have it there. People can also have good training facility there. So the importance of that uh, facility in Kofori Dua is enormous. There is, however, the small matter of accessibility. If this facility will be open to them to come and use, to have a feel of the tartan tracks, uh, to have a feel of the pitch, how a pitch, a normal football pitch is, that will, we, we, we are going to have a lot of talent coming out of uh, the children because now the, the older ones, I, I think they, they are grown. So we should, we should start looking at the, the younger ones who will have a feel of, and I, I, I believe they should always open it up to them to, to, to use it for their, even for their training, not for even their competitions alone, for their training to help them develop their talents. I don't know whether it is open for people to train in or not. What I heard about a month or two months ago that they've not yet opened it for people to have access to it. If the situation is the same, I will use some media to appeal to authorities that they should open it up for people to use it. There may be a few issues regarding the Koforidia Youth Resource Centre, but this is the first multi-purpose sports facility in the region, and its possibilities are enormous. Explore the boundless possibilities. Let this stadium with auxiliary facility be the catalyst for your dreams to flourish. For Joy Sports, Victor Achutama. Now, former communications director of the Ghana Football Association, Ibrahim Sanidara, has played down the issue regarding conflict of interest over Kwesi Apia's positions. Apia is in charge of Sudan, who will face Ghana in the 2025 Afcon qualifiers. However, concerns have been raised about his loyalty as he also serves Ghana football after being elected to the Executive Council. However, Sani, who is a CAF media officer, insists Apia can recuse himself on the seat of the Ghana FA until the qualifiers are done. I also leave. I also support him that Kwesi Apia should not resign. Why? Because, uh, number one, I don't see uh, the, the issue that people have been raising. In fact, um, we had a similar case with the Ghana national team. <laughs> Ghana played against Serbia at the World Cup in 2010. Who was in charge of the Ghana national team then? Milovan Raiva. Raiva. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was a Serb. He beat Serbia. Yeah. Maybe the difference between him and Ghana is, is the ESCO. But there's always a case where people can recuse themselves from such discussions. And it should be a straightforward case. I think Kwesi Apia being, there, being in charge of Sudan and also being in the ESCO would add a lot of good to Ghana football. An example is just simple. Um, there are now about three <coughs> Sudanese players joining Kotoko, for example. It is through his ingenuity. The learning experiences he would have in Sudan he will bring it back as a Ghanaian to impact on Ghana football. So I don't <laughs> see if there are any issues of, let's say, um, people who think perhaps conflict, he can recuse himself from those meetings and carry on as usual. He's not on the Black Stars manage yeah. Management Committee. He doesn't take day-to-day -day decisions. Well, some Ghanaians are in disagreement. They are insisting that Kwesi Apia must resign from his role as the GFA Executive Council member. Kwesi Apia being an ESCO member at the same time as uh, coach of Sudan. I think GFA need to terminate that contract immediately. Because why Kwesi Apia will still be an ESCO member at the same time uh, in Sudan coaching? No, he can't do that. It, it, it has never happened in any country in this world. At least, they must show maturity. They must terminate the contract fast. Because Ghana, we need improvement too. The football, we, do. we all like football. But if this kind of things they happen inside GFA and they, they watch them, they move that way, my brother, it will affect us. I believe that Kwesi Apia should resign because there are a lot of information where Kwesi Apia might feed our counterparts. Because these were people that we are going to meet. 
and raising concern on football, you know what things go. There are certain things that are being made secretly so that your other opponents will never see what is going on. So, Kwesiapia being on both sides, I don't think it will help Ghana. Kwesiapia can still be the head coach of Sudan and the part of the uh, uh, ESCO. Yeah, he can. And uh, there's no problem with that because he's, uh, he's part of the technical team of Sudan and not executive member of the uh, Sudanese uh, uh, Football Federation. So basically, um, with GFA, it is only an executive position he's having. They deliberate on maybe financial side or how to improve uh, various uh, football, like the cones, uh, Division 1, Division 2, and the Premier League, not the national team. He should uh, resign from uh, the GFA position he has now so that if you concentrate on the Sudan job, he concentrates on it because he can't be the head coach of Sudan and uh, be part of the GFA board whilst we and Sudan are in the same group for the next uh, Afghan qualifier. So I think uh, it would be better for him to resign for, from the Ghana GFA uh, board. Yeah. So far as he's heading the Sudanese national team, I think he should resign from the GFA school. That will help us because if we didn't do that, the strategies that we want to use against the Sudanese, maybe being the member of the school, it might affect our strategies. And he's our ex-coach before, so he might give them one or two information against us. So I think him resign will be our best. He should resign. This is the AM Show. Welcome back as we get into our big stories. But kickstarting matters. Are you stressed out about all your cleaning needs? Well, worry no more. Cast away worry. Dan's World Services is your one-stop shop that meets all your commercial and residential cleaning needs from pest control, janitorial and house cleaning, event cleaning and waste management, carpet and sofa cleaning, and more. Whether you're at home or at work, we understand and know how haptic cleaning can be coupled with your busy lifestyle. So we've got great news for you. Dan's World Environmental and Facility Management Services has got you covered. We excel in whatever we do, leaving you beyond your expectations. Locate us at Excel House opposite Regimanuel Estates, Nungwa Barria, or call us on these numbers, 0302-905-538 or 0555-752-361. Dan's World Services beyond expectation. And now we get into our big stories. WIAC is to consider the deployment of private invigilators as 18 teacher invigilators have been arrested three days into the BEC exercise for malpractices, but WIAC says the integrity of the exercise is intact. Well, how do we navigate this existential challenge or threat of examination malpractice? We discuss that issue together with other related matters, the free SHS bill and others. And joining us in the studio, Dr. Clement Apaki is a deputy ranking member on the Education Committee of Parliament. He is also legislator for Bwilsa South. Later, we'll be joined on the phone by Kofi Asari of EduWatch, Education Watch. And um, we'll get into the details from there. Doc, good morning. Good morning, Sir Luke. Yeah, what did you Sir Luke. That is uh, good morning, Mbuli. Ah. Oh. So Luke. Okay. So you say good morning. How, how, will, I, how will I respond? I will say so Luke, and then you say so Luke Nalong. So Luke Nalong. So Luke Nalong. So Luke Nalong. Yes. You, you've heard of uh, Nalem clothing. Yes. Nalem clothing. Is that the source, the origin? Yes. Nalem, the founder of Nalem clothing is my cousin, uh, Greg, Greg Kanko. Small so, world. So Nalem means good, nice, Mbuli. So, Solunalong. Solunalong. Uh, then it means I am fine. I am good. No, it is the or? response. So, good morning. Uh -huh. You say good morning, right? Okay. Then, if you want to proceed further, you will say, Kubasa, are you well? Mm. Then you respond, Kubasa. Okay. So, I agree to you, Mbuli. So, Luke? 
Selena. Good, you've done well. <laughs> <Your> first lesson. <laughs> Okay, so well, we got you know, some. But not always sharp. Oh, we are so, sharp, 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 not surprised sharp, sharp, at all. Sharp. We've got some lessons <laughs> going on this morning. Interesting. I see. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, nice way to start uh, off the um, the conversation. Very but well. Let's get right right down to it. Education, and in recent times, I don't know what we'll do to cure this bit about um, examination malpractice, but it appears to have become a hydra-headed problem. I mean, to be fair, we've had it for decades, but it appears now it's taking a different dimension, putting on different clothing. Even before we get to what Wyatt has said, over the years, when you follow the figures and the latest releases from Wyatt itself, mm. what do you see? Well, first of all, let me say good morning to you and to our viewers, and of course, to my constituents who are watching. I mean, as you know, uh, we are in an election year, so many, many of us are seeking uh, a reaffirmation of the mandate that yeah. we are currently serving, which obviously will come to an end. Mm. So that is why I had to greet you in Bully, because I know <laughs> our constituents are watching. They are watching it's part yeah. of my responsibility to also project my people, my language, and my culture. Indeed. As an anthropologist, Indeed. I believe it is very important because it's my identity. So it learning that Bruce, I mean, I'm a pusu, I mean, I saw you. Exam of practices. You are right in indicating that it is not an entirely new phenomena. Mm. Mm. Um, we grew up to meet it. We heard about it. We went through the same processes largely. I mean. I did Form 1 to 5, wrote the A-levels, and based on my performance at uh, Sandman Secondary Technical, I went to Nandom Secondary School to do my sis form, and I wrote the A-levels. Over the period, uh, whilst it is the case that there has always been one or another form of exam or practices, the data would show that not only has it increased, but it has now become endemic to the extent that you now have different stakeholders whose contribution should rather be reducing the phenomena of example practices. But we are seeing evidence to the contrary. And I think that is why this most recent development gives a lot of cause for concern and serious worry. And look, let's be honest. It is not just the BEC. It is the same with WASI. And I remember three years ago, when, you know, Africa Education Watch issued one of its monitoring reports on WASI, mm. I felt so frightened and terrified. And based on that, I filed a question. But I went on to file a private member's motion, which was admitted by the speaker and is still standing, asking that parliament constitutes a bipartisan committee to investigate the escalation in exam or practices, particularly as it pertains to WASI, from 2013. I mean, at the time, I said uh, 2013 to uh, 20. 21. And although this motion has been admitted by the speaker, action is yet to be initiated in parliament around this very worrying issue. And you see, I see a number of factors mm. contributing to what we all now admit 
has become a canker. In fact, a source of national embarrassment. Because you must remember that we are not isolated. We are a member of a community of nations. So when these kinds of occurrences are recorded repeatedly, and it seems to be as though, in spite of, quote unquote, all our best efforts, we are not seeing a reduction or an elimination of the challenge. It doesn't bode well for our regional, continental, and even global image. Mm. Because ed education, we know, is, 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 is perhaps the most important, if you like, service that one will receive and the service that a nation can offer to its citizens for obvious reasons. And, and because we also live in a competitive world, when our wards want to move and continue their studies in other parts of the continent and indeed the world, clearly there will be question marks. Regardless of whether they were beneficiaries of, if you like, um, examinations that lacked integrity or not, the broad perspective would be that in Ghana, this is what pertains. And so anyone who is of that country who had received basic and secondary education, their certificate ought to be looked at and scrutinized. And mm -hmm. that is not good. Now, with the recent development, and let me begin from there, then we can expand it. But it was important I laid a broader context so let's, let's go about, narrow, about let's the issue down of exam mm -hmm. or practices and the implications. Mm -hmm. That is what I sought to do. Right. Now let's drill down to what we are dealing with presently. BEC started, I believe, on the 8th of this month. Mm -hmm. It's barely halfway through. Mm -hmm. I'm told the last paper would likely be written on Saturday. I think uh, it will be Arabic. But most of the students are expected to have written their final papers on uh, Friday, which is actually tomorrow. WAIC has an arrangement that it has used over time. And listening to WAIC itself over the years, WAIC is beginning to feel that there ought to be some serious changes in terms of the other collaborating partners and the personnel. Those collaborating partners, if you like, second to WAIC or make available to WAIC to assist in the administration of the examinations. In this case, teachers. And you would expect that this should be to the contrary. You see, it is against the code of ethics. It is against the code of conduct for a professional teacher to assist a student to cheat or to be caught trying to assist a student to cheat in an exam. It is a no-go area. And so to have this report, as of yesterday, I had heard that 18 persons comprising invigilators and supervisors had been apprehended and are being investigated, and some were handed over to the police. Yet that is not going to affect the for, credibility, the credibility of... For, for, of, for, of for, for, trying, for the sanctity of the examination. For trying to help students to cheat. Mm. Two things. One, I expect the Ghana Education Service to identify and sanction those teachers 
to serve as a deterrent to others because this conduct is reprehensible. It is even a lot more worrying that it is coming from teachers because if they have done what they ought to do, and many of them do, and they have properly prepared their students, this will be in the case of schools where the teachers who were apprehended are teachers of that school. Mm. Then they ought not to try to find these unorthodox ways of giving their students a leg up. That is one. Two, it clearly cannot be acceptable that no matter what the circumstances may be, and I know there are issues. Look, let's be honest. There are issues as far as public basic education is concerned. And one of them is that these students who are writing the BEC have not seen a textbook based on the new curriculum which came in to, in, into effect in September 2019. At the junior secondary school level, they are supposed to be under the auspices of what we call the common core curriculum. For P1 to P6 is the standard-based curriculum. So these students who are writing, I have a lot of sympathy for them, and I pray that they do well, because truly, they did not get the full complement of being prepared, not because their teachers didn't want to, and not because their parents didn't want them to be properly prepared, and not because they didn't want to. But government failed in making sure that textbooks were produced for them to use. So from GHS 1, 2, and 3, they are writing BEC. They have never seen a textbook. But that still should not be an excuse for either the teachers to feel that they have to engage in this illegality to help their students or for the students and their parents to think that the best way forward is for them to try and influence invigilators and supervisors to do the unthinkable. Whether but this... moving away from the bit about textbooks, uh, sometimes I, I shudder. Is it that this administration has got everything wrong with I know why is owed some sums of yes, money. Yes, I'll, I'll come to that. But, but sometimes I want the political slant to be taken out. It is our education. Yes. It is our basic education. Yes. Whatever reforms may come there or be applied affect all of us, um, our, our people we know, people in our families, and all of that. On the bit about textbooks, it wouldn't be the first time we've had some challenges, would it? Not this prolonged. And not as far as the textbooks have to do with a new curriculum. Mm. I mean, you would agree. You introduce a new curriculum which comes into effect in 2019. Mm. And we are in 2024. And yet, the students who are supposed to be beneficiaries of that curriculum change don't even have access to the textbooks. So it definitely is a problem. Mm. It is unprecedented, honestly. I don't know of any time in our history where a curriculum has been changed and almost um, six, six years down the line, year 2019, mm. six years down the line, we don't have the full complement of textbooks based on the, uh, the new curriculum. I mean, even from KG to uh, primary six, only 65% of the required textbooks have been supplied. For JHS, zero as we speak. But, but this problem, so I have a message coming through from uh, an academic. I, I, I don't have his permission to mention his name, sure. so I will not. But he has headed one of our universities. And he says, I rusticated or basically suspended several students for different periods of time. It has been with us for a very long, uh, for very long. It yes. has probably increased for various reasons which should be interrogated. Yes. He says... When I sacked the common entrance exams um, in 1973, I don't think we would know him from that, there were some reports of cheating, but not as widespread as it is today. The human nature of wanting to succeed by fair or foul means because there are no consequences or sanctions abound. I agree. Then the question then would be, 
what are some of these reasons that are allowing people or making people feel we can cut corners, making people feel I can study nothing, go there, and then slip in, in my exam booklet, call my mother on this number. That's right. And think that I can, I can score good grades. But on WIAC itself, its head of public affairs, John Cappy, has explained, he's been trying to give some explanations in ref reference to the invigilators, the invigilators who have been arrested. He says, quote, we are not trying, we are trying to see what we can do to make an appeal to the Director General of the Ghana Education Service and see what message we can send across to get the invigilators to sit up and do what is expected of them. That was a few days ago. Now we do know that WIAC is saying the teachers and invigilators who have been arrested for malpractices will face prosecution. Where do we go from here? Stiffer measures? Well, is countering, it... countering also the reasons that people feel I can get away with it. Where do we I, look I think, for starters? I think, I think it is a hydra-headed monster. It's multifaceted. So the two suggestions you, you have tabled should work, but we need to do more. And you see, talking about the punitive sanctions, I believe that is the area where we haven't done well as a nation. And I would say Wayek itself too, somehow has not done well in pushing that angle. I mean, since I became a member of parliament and since I had the privilege to be a member of the education committee, there is no year that Africa Education Watch and other monitors, including my good friend, you know, uh, uh, comrade, uh, Kwame Alovi have not reported on exam practices involving sometimes even some of the security personnel that are deployed to assist, of course, invigilators and supervisors. Mm. Yet, we don't hear of the sanctions. And so when people have the impression that you can do this and walk away, as you know, my senior you know, fellow academic has indicated, when people feel that they can do wrong and walk away and punished, clearly it breeds what we call the copycat syndrome. And I think that is part of the problem. So Waik, the Ghana Education Service, and the Ghana Police Service, they ought to be up and doing. Let those who do wrong, who have been caught doing wrong, be sanctioned, and they should be sanctioned in a way that will be public, so that it then sends a signal and a warning to others who may be tempted to do similar. Is why not doing? Is why not doing exactly that? Can you can you not applaud them for that? They are saying the teachers and invigilators arrested for malpractices will face prosecution. Well, every year that's what they say. That is why I'm making this point. No, but and, if, and if, if, if the people are facing prosecution, is that not a step in the right direction? It's in the right direction, but we, we, as I'm sitting now, I've not seen a report by Waik or the Ghana Police Service that has been put in the public domain indicating that for 2023's BEC and WASI, these were the number of cases, um, these were... The, uh, the outcomes, we have not seen that. Mm. Have you seen it? So they, all, they also need to do something that would elevate this issue to the national level, both as a deterrent and also to serve as a warning and to draw the needed national attention. Mm. To question all of us as parents, as guardians, as teachers, and our students. So why and should be proactive rather than reactionary? And now exactly. that you mentioned parents, in the Ashanti region, we do know that um, WIAC, the Ashanti regional WIAC has stated that parents, uh, teachers are no longer allowed to go to exam centers. That, that's a step. They I have agree. Taken, they have adopted a step and said, don't even come within a certain perimeter. I agree. Don't come here. I agree. And you see, WIAC, quite honestly, is constrained as we speak. You're going to talk about money? Well, yeah, because it's related, mm. right? Because Waik is saying, in fact, one of the proposals I've had 
is that Waik is considering recruiting, training, and deploying its own invigilators and supervisors. I, I had the, um, you know, the uh, public relations, was it the media liaison officer, uh, Mr. Kapi. Mm. He, he said that. But if Waik is to do that, Waik would need a lot more resources. Well, one of the benefits of the arrangement between Waik and the Guard Education Service is that the teachers obviously are employees of the GES. So the type of remuneration or stipend that they will get, not much for the services that they are providing to assist Waik in undertaking its obligation, which is a very important national assignment as far as we are concerned, would not be at the same level compared to if they were to recruit, train, and deploy their own invigilators. Has that, not, has that not always been a problem? Has that not always been the case? In terms of what? What are you just saying? No, so I'm saying that why are you now thinking about going solo mm. in the wake of this revelation? Then they would have to marshal and mobilize more resources mm. if they are to replace the GES supplied, if you like, quasi staff mm. that they currently get to help supervise and then, you know, invigilate. But I'm the saying exams. that the GES, like you say, quasi staff, has that not always been the case? That's what I'm saying. But Waik is now saying, look, even they are beginning to disappoint us. So you subscribe to that move? Yeah, I think that if, if Waik feels very strongly that deploying their own invigilators and invigilators would solve the problem, why not? These because people, these people they are going, going to deploy are still going to be Ghanaians, human beings well, who are still corrupt. That, that is where I have said one of the... We could do this, get funding for that, and still realize that. And, and the truth is you will never have an exam that is foolproof, that no. has no element. If we for, want... It, it is on the ascendancy, but you will not have an exam that is without... I agree. Practice. I agree. There would always be an attempt to cheat for, for some reasons that you and I don't know. Mm. Some do it out of greed. Those who facilitate and the beneficiaries, definitely out of greed. Another factor is the overt competitive nature of examinations in Ghana because exams are a very important hurdle for one's progress in life. Mm. And when you have few secondary schools classified as grade A, where every parent wants his or her ward to go to a grade A school versus a grade C school, it heightens the competition. And that I, then, thought, I thought the CSSPS had, had resolved that issue. It has not. It has not. <laughs> you and I know that it has not. That in itself is, is another conversation. So I'm just now trying to tease out some of the factors that would promote you know, exam mal malpractices. And then also the issue of people feeling that they can do it and get away with it. Mm. So yes, it is true that once it is a human endeavor, there is bound to be one or two instances. I mean, that is, is tolerable. But when it becomes endemic, and it seems to be on the ascendancy, year in, year out, then we need to do a holistic rethink about the entire architecture. And I think that is the angle that Waik is approaching. Look, if we want to be honest, we ought to also look at deploying technology to address some of these. Like what? Well, CCTV? CCTV one, but the, the other component eventually, which is what is happening in other parts of the world, is that, you know, computer-based. Computer-based. I mean, we ought to get to a stage where students will write their exams on their computers in the schools that they are. 
They don't have to go to any other center. Even managing, it is managing the basics. It is, I mean, it is you, happening you, in you, other parts you, of the world. Know, it is. I agree. So, I've I mean, taken, I've taken forward, examples right? like that. But the question is, at that level, looking at our logistical constraints, WIAC itself is bleeding yes, when it yes, comes to yes. funding. No, no, but we are, we, we, are, we are having a conversation. Securing <laughs> computers we are, we are having and, a and a the technology and all that software. We are having a conversation. Mm. Uh, that's what I'm saying. A time to come. We would have no choice anyway. Because the way the global system is going, eventually this is going to become standard. But in the immediate, what do we do? Let's sanction the few teachers. And I say few, because we ought not to bastardize the almost 600,000 teachers from KG to you know, uh, 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 senior high school three, because maybe some 16 or you know, 18 teachers have misconducted uh, themselves. Mm. But it should be a wake-up call. But to me, this that we are talking about is a macrocosm of how our society's moral compass has deviated. As a nation, our morals have decayed to the extent that wrongdoing doesn't seem to be that much frowned upon. And for me, this is just an example because... Is it just now or is it that it, this has been, you know, festering for a while? It has been festering, but we are seeing it. And don't take it from me. Many well-meaning Ghanaians mm. have made the same pronouncement that we have lost our moral compass. I mean... We celebrate wealth without even thinking about the source of the wealth. And we think it is okay. Why should we do that? We celebrate success. Without, well, so, without so me, bothering to question how that success was obtained. Well, and that, that is the case with this that we are talking about. So the students who are going to come out, mm. we are going to celebrate those who are going to do well. Mm. without even pondering over the possibility that they may have been beneficiaries of underhanded the imagination. Means, the means justify the Exactly. Mm. That is a society that we have become. And that is very unfortunate. So this is a macrocosm of what we have become. What then would, be, what then would be your solid solutions? Res reset this nation. What, what then would be your solid solutions to proffer? Assume you are an education minister around a time like this. What would you do in the immediate term, medium term, plan for the long term? Just encapsulate them in about a minute. I would have, by now, held a meeting with Waik because, as I told you, I filed a private member's motion on this matter three years ago, which would tell you that it's a matter that is dear to me for good reason. I would have held a meeting with Waik to discuss with them how they feel the state can intervene to ensure that what they do is done in a manner that would engender global integrity as far as the certificates they award to our awards are concerned because they are the experts. They know what ought to be done. Mm. And we have had some meetings with Waik as a member of the Education Committee. And I even have here Waik's presentation to our committee in preparation for the 2024 budget. And Waik has always told us the challenges that they face. So that would be one, that conversation. Two, would be to ensure that Waik is adequately resourced. So that when government says that we are going to absorb the examination fees for all BECE students mm. and WASI students. Government pays WAIC in a timely manner rather than this tendency where government has to wait for WAIC to come public or to solicit the support of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Education to raise alarm bells for government then to remit in an attempt to defray an indebtedness. As we speak, 
out of the 80,000, I mean, 80, 80 million Ghana cities old like, as far as we know, government has only made available 47 million. Okay. And so, the, the point number two would be to ensure that WAIC is properly resourced in terms of government meeting its obligations to WAIC in as far as the provision of services are concerned. And then we also need to institute a public awareness campaign because parents ought to know that they also have an obligation to ensure that the awards get the grace that they deserve by dent of hard work okay. and not financing invigilators and, uh, uh, if you like, supervisors so, so that would be your to three help their wars. That, that so those are three. three pronged approach. Yes. Right. Let me bring in, as we cap off the conversation, uh, Kofi Asari, he is with Africa Education Watch. Kofi, good morning. You'd probably have to unmute, Kofi. Good morning to your audience and panelists. It's good to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. This latest development, uh, which has been with us for a long time, but now people say it's getting worse and worse. I just got the head of a tertiary institution, former head, who says, look, back in my day, yes, a few of these, but now it has taken you know, greater proportions. Why do you think this is happen happening? And is WIAC tackling the issue from the right end? Well, I think it's happening because it has become a culture. Um, the act is no news. I mean, since we started monitoring examinations in 2020, the act is no news. It's only the reportage. It's only the, the, um, the reportage on the act, which is news. But the act itself, I don't think it's news. To be honest, what, what is going on is never an exception. It's a norm, except that the light is only shining on, on it, you know, and then people are beginning to talk about it. The second reason why you may or not you may not be hearing uh, many of such in the past, or you may not have heard of many of such in the past, is that WIAC itself is constrained. You know, by 2022, WIAC had um, its own supervisors. Um, the number of WIAC's own supervisors that they had to monitor WASI was only 20% of the centers. So WIAC had about 770 centers, and they had only about, um, I mean, less than 150 supervisors. Then the meaning is that they were able to be in only 20% of the centers at any given time. Now, this is WASI, which has seven, which had then, I mean, two years ago, about 770 centers. BEC has 2,000 plus centers. So how do you expect WIAC to use their own supervisors mm. um, to get BEC? It's not going to happen. So the few places that WIAC's limited supervisors will be available are the ones that you hear such stories coming from. But where in majority of the centers, over 95% for BEC, where they are manned by junior staff and teachers, I'm sorry, you won't hear anything. The same thing goes on there everywhere, rural labor. So you're that saying that you're saying that by and large the GES staff are complicit. Oh, the GES staff are at the center of examination or practice. Mm. Uh, what we call examination room collusion. They are at the center. It is not they and anyone. But but is that There's is a that a fair is that a fair assessment? Uh, are you saying that <laughs> it, it is the case predominantly? It is the fact. The fact is that, check the data on prosecutions, check the data on arrests. It's always 99% a teacher or a staff of the school who is not a teacher. Or, yes, and we have done, we've been doing this work for over five years now. And I'm saying that 99.9% .9 of the facilitators, the purveyors, the, 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 those who have pecuniary benefits, those who benefit from the business of examination collusion, at the center level, evolves around the GES staff. That's it, because they are the invigilators. Only they are the invigilators. Now, in about 80% of the case, they are the supervisors. 
the one who supervises the mediator and everybody. You understand? And so where you where WIAC officials are not there, it's always a field day. Now, the one percent, which is not genius staff, are WIAC staff. So because we have videos, we have videos of centers where even though they were WIAC, you know, officials, they, they went and took two thousands. And then they just left. Who they took who, who took this money? The WIAC when the WIAC external who was there when they when, when they are compromised, the strategy is not to show up. So they will be around, they will be around mm. the school, but they will even come to the center. Yeah, you know. I so see. our experience is that at the center is the teacher, not all teachers, but some teachers who you know have agreed to procure in, and I mean participate in this business in this in this criminal. Court. To make money and so we recommended as far back as 2021 that the the fight against examination room collusion starts with the total elimination of the genius staff from mm. the examination center mm. and from the examination process they shouldn't be part of the assessment process because they have a vested interest in the results of the student or the learners and by extension the teachers out to be judged among others based on the pass rates in their school. The, the teachers have KPIs, and their KPIs, the, the major KPI is what's the pass rate and BC pass rate. So in other words, it makes no sense to allow the GES staff to be a part of the process. It is, it is not even a potential conflict of interest. It's a conflict of interest, and we have raised it several. Now, the challenge is that uh, we are happy why is now having a conversation. I mean, we have now raised issue about the possibility of engaging uh, private private invigilators. Years ago, about 12 years ago, why piloted the use of non non teachers, you know, in the in, in the particular schools to do invigilation. Like they brought teachers from other schools to invigilate in other schools so that you know the possibility of compromising them was minimized. The the best practice is that if you have such a situation where at the at the center of the more practice. And, and I'm talking about the examination room collusion, not the leakage. The examination room collusion at the center is the teacher who, when the questions arrive, they take a shot of it, send it on WhatsApp to teachers who are on standby waiting to solve the questions. Within 30 minutes, questions are solved, transmitted onto WhatsApp platforms into the center. And that same teacher and his colleagues are in the center in relating. And another one from either the education office or the headmaster in that school is also a supervisor. This, this arrangement, can never be broken without taking genius staff off. And that is why I'm happy that WIAC itself uh, appreciating the fact that they have such a time. Is, is this going to be any solution um, that will carry, you know, that will hold water, so to speak? After all, you just said that some WIAC staff, they themselves get compromised. I, I was telling uh, Dr. Apak earlier that they are human, just like the GES staff, and they are corruptible. Is this going to be a, a solution, so to speak? No, there will not be one, one silver bullet in ending examination more practice um, at the central level, which we call what we call examination room collusion. There has to be a, a watcher of the watchman. Exactly. So immediately you engage private security, for instance, to be the watchman, they must be watched. So you definitely need technology. You will need CCTV cameras installed at all centers. You know, um, to provide um, a second layer of supervision to the watchmen. That for me is key. So just bringing in private security or any other private regulators to do regulation, it's not, it's not the end of it. You must have a mechanism for monitoring their output. Apart from that, we from the demand side, there's a culture that requires, you know, um, um, requires a, a significant amount of behavior change uh, among the students. They have been they have been ushered into a, a subculture of cheating to pass, and this, and they, and they start this you know, at this level, BC level. Because if you are seeing um, snapshot of papers, people who been arrested for taking snapshots in the examination hall, our experience in the business tells us that immediately you see that, then it means there are students in the examination hall who have mobile phones. But those snapshots will be solved, and then they will, they will be put on Telegram platforms for students to copy in the examination room. Okay. So once students have learned how to use mobile phones to cheat mm. at, at, in junior high schools, 
it means that they, they have been they, they have already been um, socialized into that culture and then it will take some level of um, um, effort to unlessen all these bad qualities. Dr. So, Park was just, just, was just talking also, about uh, more sensitization as one of his uh, solutions for parents and others to realize that this is what you have to do as a parent. These are your roles and all that. As I take your final words, I also want to find out from you, is it going to be financially practical to do this, seeing that WIAC itself is hemorrhaging funds. They need money they are not getting to conduct exams and all of that. If they are bringing in these private invigilators, it's going to come at a cost. Will it, will it not be a pyrrhic victory? Will it make sense on the financial level? Your final thoughts on that. The financial level investment will make sense if it is effective. Okay, so if you are spending, let's say we are doing about 90 million on BC. If we are doing, if we are spending twice that, 180 million in BC, because we are not going to use teachers or DNA staff as invigilators and pay them something very small because they are already government staff. We are going to use private people, which will cost more. Then it means that the value for money case is made mm -hmm. if it is effective in the carbon examination room okay. pollution. So for me, it is not about the amount, but it's about the effectiveness of that investment in carbon. Okay. Um, a practice that has moved from about 0.2% in 2018 mm. to 10% um, by 2023. The second right. thing is that, you see, any investment we make in examination more practice, uh, sorry, in, in carbon examination and collusion must also come at the back of strengthening law enforcement. The WIAC right. law is not fit for purpose in dealing with all these new dynamics we are discussing. All so right. many a time, the person who is held culpable is, um, is, 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 is the teacher. There are other people within the value chain who are, not, who, are, who, are, who are left off the hook. And if you look at the prosecution trend, the obvious um, convictions normally come from um, impersonation. A lot of these dynamics are not captured fully That's under right. the criminal code and also under the uh, WIAC law. So WIAC itself has appreciated the need for government to amend their laws. As far back as 2020, when we started engaging WIAC, Parliament and all the other stakeholders. But since then, we've not seen any effort you know, to amend YX laws to make it bite more in terms of the new emerging dynamics in this um, whole business. So okay. this will come on at the back of um, um, an effective YX law that is biting enough okay. to deter both students and, and teachers and all other protons within the, the, the entire examination right. for the work. Kofi. Thank you so much for uh, the insight uh, on this conversation. We're grateful for your time. That is Kofi Asari. He's with Africa Education uh, Watch. A minute. Yes. Final thoughts. Yes, I, I agree with uh, Kofi. And uh, in fact, the Minister for Education is the one that should lead the effort to get the WAIC law changed so that it can be fit for purpose in this century that we are. So, um, and that is why when you asked me the question earlier on, that if I were to be in the shoes of uh, the minister, what would I do? And I said, I would engage Waik to see what needs to be done. And of course, this is one thing that ought to happen. By the nature of our system, Waik itself has no capacity to come to parliament and seek any amendment to a law or to uh, enact a law. It has to be done by the sector minister under whose jurisdiction WAIC uh, is an agency. And in Ghana, uh, WAIC is under the Ministry of uh, uh, Education. So I, I agree with him. Mm. And, and you see, he confirms the issue of laxity in, prose uh, in prosecution. We don't, we don't hear much about the prosecutions. And that... Well, at least now change. some of them have come to the fore. Doc, we're it is always like that at the that, beginning. That you, you know. Well, we can build upon that. <laughs> Dr. Clement Apak is a legislator for Builsa South. He is also deputy ranking member on the Education Committee of Parliament. We also had Kofi Asari of Africa Education Watch. I have this message coming through from the former head of a tertiary institution I mentioned. Unfortunately, uh, I have to wrap quickly. Clearly, the moral decadence in all facets of our lives has just permeated our exams. In the past, we have admitted a few students with straight A's to some programs 
who just couldn't cope. In other words, they got the A's, but maybe not, not through the right means. So they came and they could not cope. This is one of the reasons entrance exams have been introduced uh, for some programs in our universities. Mm -hmm. I personally think we have enough laws to govern our exams. We need a morality campaign from kindergarten. And I might as well stay, uh, say, for example, in places like Ashesi, you know, they have this thing where the honor code. they leave you. All right? It, it's but called the, you, the honor code. If you, if you do otherwise, you lose everything. That's right. So, and the, that, the, that, the that honor should be code. The case later, nothing. Everywhere. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Apak, uh, and pleasure. my gratitude to Kofi Asari as well. Under the distinguished patronage of Her Ladyship Justice Gertrude uh, Tokonu, Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, the UPSA Law School proudly presents the 2024 Lifetime Achievement in Law Award and Honorific Lecture. The event presents a rare but high-level opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the outstanding and exemplary contributions of notable Ghanaian personalities in the areas of the rule of law, governance, and the legal academy. This year's Lifetime Achievement in Law Award will be conferred on Nana Dr. SKB Asante, Paramount Chief of Asante Asokore and former Director, United Nations Center on Transnational Corporations and Chairman of the Committee of Experts, which drafted the 1992 Constitution of Ghana at an August ceremony befitting the aura of the occasion. The event comes off on Thursday, the 25th of July, 2024 at 5 p.m. at the Kofi Ohene Kunedu Auditorium at the UPSA. Just visit the social media platforms of the UPSA Law School or call 0245. 347-946 for more information. Do stay. We have a lot more action coming your way shortly. Here we are. It's another amazing installment of AM Exclusive. We bring you those exclusive interviews with all those people you'd love to hear from. And today we have another banger, another good one. We're going to be engaging the European uh, Union, especially the European uh, Union in Ghana or the Commission in Ghana. And we have joining uh, the conversation today His Excellency Irchad Razali, the EU Ambassador to Ghana. He's taken time to sit with us today. And, well, let's get right down to it. How are you doing? Bonjour. Ça va? Ça bouge. <laughs> Good to have you join the conversation. I'm going to start on a bit of an unorthodox note. You're three years in Ghana. Almost. What's, what's the experience been like? Ah, it's been an amazing experience. Mm. Getting to know better the country, getting to not understanding because it will be a, a lack of humility, but trying to dig deeper in the way the Ghana as a country and as a nation works. And uh, you know, the journey is amazing because it's so rich, so many layers, so many dynamism. Mm -hmm. So every day you learn something. What do you find the most interesting about Ghana? The most interesting is what you get on Ghana from the outside and what you discover Ghana when you are staying okay. in the country. And there are many things that uh, are not exactly what you believe. Right. <laughs> but in both ways, some uh, you say you are a bit surprised and some you say, aha, aha, as you say here, aha, so nice. So, of course, sometimes outside of Ghana, you hear certain things. Oh, this is what Ghana is like. But here, it's not exactly the same thing. But I think it's a fact of life. It's true for everything. But right. uh, getting to live in Ghana gives you a better access, a better in-depth um, understanding. And, you know, you get to be interested mm -hmm. to, uh, to crack the layers. Okay. Before we get into EU month, my final probing question. What's your favorite Ghanaian food? Still, um, palava sauce. Palava sauce? Yes. What, what do you take it with? Yam, rice? Yam. 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 Yam, but mashed yam. I have a soft spot for mashed yam. So if you didn't know how to warm your way into the heart of the EU ambassador to Ghana, you get some palava sauce with mashed yam and you're good to go. 
But let's get down to it. The European Union and Ghana. You celebrated EU Month recently. Correct. It was interesting because I didn't know you were a boxer. You were sparring I didn't know, with... I didn't know either. <laughs> you know, I didn't know either. It came as a surprise. Oh, really? No, jokes at the side. Um, I have two, I would say, not well-known, but uh, two um, hobbies here in Ghana. Okay. Uh, one is boxing and one is um, beading. Beading? Yes, bead, because this country is very big on beads. And these are the things that I you see, don't... I see, I see. These are the things you don't necessarily know from the outside. Mm. At least I didn't. And then when you arrive, you say, ah, oh, this is a big thing for the culture, for the everyday life, some symbolism, so on and so forth. So, yes, boxing. I've begun to box since I arrived three years ago, two years and a half. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that uh, beside football, boxing was a huge sport in Ghana, a huge thing. And uh, my coach uh, brought me on a number of occasions at uh, Bukom, Bukom Arena to, to watch uh, fights and to enjoy, you know, just the vibes. And we, we thought that it would be a perfect way to connect with um, people with a bunch of people who are not necessarily used to meet with a diplomatic um, core mm -hmm. ambassadors and we say let's do it let's try to create this connection and do, would you say the connection was achieved <coughs> that that nexus was created on the back of you know those activities uh, 4000 people attended the um, the stadium was fully packed they were a good 1,000 people, unfortunately, who could not make it from outside. Mm. And as, as we speak, we are already thinking of uh, where to bring it further, to, to build on that link and to make it even more meaningful. We are, we are thinking of doing something to, um, to, to build on that with still the professor, Azuma mm. Nelson, Azuma Nelson. Right. because he has, you know, this vibrancy, this um, humility as well, and he's a people's man, and it's so easy to work with him, and it's so, I would say, rewarding, so we want to carry on and move forward the adventure. I am curious as you talk about that adventure because um, boxing in Ghana, I mean, it has seen better days. It's, it's still up there, but there were days when we had champions in many different weight classes and all of that. With your affection for boxing, do you think you would want to get into a bit of promoting pugilism or boxing in Ghana? Do you think you not my job. interest in? Not my job. As, I know as we, we have a say, sports ministry and youth ministry, but... Precisely. <laughs> but what I can do mm. is to you know, join forces with the ones who want to move it further. But for that, I mean, when it comes to policies, and this is the same answer for the upcoming questions, we are not working in Ghana. We are working with Ghana to support what are the priorities or the strategies or, you know, the interest that the country is expressing and request us to support, if anything, if they believe we have an added value. So when it comes to overall cooperation in the sporting arena, there again, we would be happy because EU months was been focusing on youth. So boxing was our way of entering or to illustrating our commitment to youth. I'm not so young, but if you want to be a good you boxer, you have, to be, uh, you, have to be, <laughs> you have to be a bit young. So this is the rational. But the important point is, it's not the end game. On the contrary, it's the beginning of an adventure. The beginning of an adventure. Well, I'm sure those who are watching us um, will be reaching out, those who are invested in boxing, and they probably say, okay, EU, come and collaborate. Uh, with us. But, but I was but at before, the All-African game and you were doing quite fine with lots oh, of medals, uh, lots of medals. Uh, uh, I was there, you were not there. Trust, I was there. Trust me, <laughs> we, 
Well, I, we, were, we were there through the cameras, yeah. but um, there have been definitely better days. We can do. We can do. I better. can imagine. But let's let's even before we get into uh, the rest of our conversation, the EU. Some I'm sure some Ghanaians will be curious. Yes, European Union, but what do you stand for in Ghana? When as ambassador, what are your goals? How how do you mean to build collaboration between Ghana and the EU? What we stand for is very uh, simple. Uh, we are built on a set of um, values and a set of set of principles. One of the largest one is um, the belief in a rules-based multilateral order, basically the UN Charter, uh, and the cooperation based on uh, you know this set of values and uh, shared interest. In Ghana, what are the shared interests? Shared interest is um, accelerating and supporting um, what we can call overall development, but basically I prefer to call it prosperity, because it is in our interest in Europe as well to have partners such as Ghana or the rest of the African continent reaching that prosperity, because mm. when you think of it, it's a no-brainer. It makes a larger market, larger partner, uh, more stable, more, um, uh, I don't want to use the word reliable, but a set of partners who are meeting eye to eye on the set of uh, principles. So this is the reason why in Ghana we are focusing our uh, partnership uh, on first and foremost job creation. This is priority number one and this is a no-brainer because uh, every year there are 400,000 youth which are entering the job market in Ghana. The second priority, there again it's a priority which has been identified by the Ghanaian authority. It's mm. not me, I didn't wake up one morning and say oh, let's do that. Second priority is um, what we call smart and sustainable cities. Because you know the rate of urbanization, you know the challenges linked to the way people are served or can access to basic services, including you know, public transportation, uh, public lights, access to water, sanitation. It's, it's a global challenge. And the third Some area... Some those falling under the SDGs. Yes, yes, of course. Mm. But jobs as well, you know, it's, it's very intricate. And the third priority or the third pillar of activities is linked to what we call governance and security. And there again, it's uh, very much linked to the regional context and uh, to you know, um, support Ghanaian national strategy in terms of uh, security, stability, uh, prevention of potential um, uh, instability linked to the region, uh, dynamics, so on and so forth. So, I would say these are the main uh, priority areas, and we have some flagship interventions, mm -hmm. which are, I would say, um, illustrating the level of ambition of the partnership. You know, we are not just we are not in the business of giving handouts. Okay, I don't come to a place and right. say, okay, we have revamped. Uh, uh, half of uh, a school and we are sh selling ourselves uh, everywhere. No, no, this is not about that. We have what we call the global gateway. The global gateway strategy. Yes, right. which is somewhat um, difficult to explain in abstracto, I would say, but the beauty with Ghana is we can illustrate with concrete cases. Okay, and so concrete walk us through. Cases. So the concrete case is we have three very good stories, success stories. Uh, one for which we, we went uh, on, your, um, on your platform together with my German and my Spanish colleagues, mm -hmm. which is the building. So I'm not speaking about a project that uh, is coming or the putting of the first uh, stone. It's the full commissioning of a very large uh, solar power station mm. um, in Wa, no, in uh, Kaleo, in the Upper West region, okay. which is up and running and which is serving 50,000. 50,000? Uh, 50, yes, 50,000 uh, people. It's, it's linked to the national grid 
And the beauty of it, it's not only increasing the national you know, output, but on top of that, it's a sustainable. It's, I mean, it's, there is no emission. Mm -hmm. And it spares the equivalent of uh, tens of thousands of the usage of car, for example, to make a comparison. So this is... Um, Do you know its capacity? I forgot to have to... I have to but it's serving about 50,000 people. It serves the needs of 50,000 households. Wow. Not individual Not households. households. So, so you it's multiply huge. that by a factor of what? Yes, Two, five, three, six, four, five. Yes. And, and that would so, give you what? So 250,000? So it's a huge thing. Yeah. And this is what we call the transformational effect of Global Gateway, because we are not mm. speaking only about energy, we are speaking about people whose potential is unlocked, because now they have energy and you know economy is based on energy transformation. The second very big story that we have, still in uh, Upper West, is the commissioning, where there again, it's not the first layer of commissioning of 670 kilometers of feeder road in Upper West uh, as well, which connects um, farmers to local markets so they can sell their product. Because otherwise their product is just going to waste. And this, for that matter, has a transformational effect. And the last one, which is, in my view, the even more ambitious because it can make structural changes and, you know, give a big push for Ghana to enter into the 21st century is the production of uh, uh, vaccines here in Ghana that is made mm. possible uh, thanks to the support of the European Union and uh, uh, to a certain extent the uh, German um, cooperation. GIZ. GIZ. GIZ is the implementing partner, but um, okay, the German uh, friends. Okay. Uh, but basically, it's, it is about not only setting up the conditions, but setting up factories mm. and establishing partnerships to, you know, um, ensure what we call the fill and finish of vaccines here in Ghana to serve not only Ghana, but the region, the continent and elsewhere, because vaccines are meant to to circulate. So this is the mm. free, I would say, great illustration of global gateway in the making in Ghana. So um, uh, this is quite a, a reward in time. Well, I see. These are mega projects. I mean, <coughs> uh, the solar project, first of all, 670 kilometers of feeder roads. And of course, we all know that post-harvest losses are some of the, is one of the major factors that cause farmers to lose out in terms of their farm mm -hmm. produce. And the and country. Now, and the, and the country, country of course, and the exports, etc. You, you name it. Yeah. And then vaccine production. I'm curious, though, of these three that you've mentioned, what have been the stories? I'm sure you've, you've executed these projects and everything, but what have been the stories from especially the beneficiary communities up north? What are some of the things you've heard the people say or which have come to your desk that, oh, the people are so grateful that this happened. What are some of the stories? No, the, the stories are many. You know, ordinary people say, okay, thanks to, the, thanks to the power station, we can do A, B, C, D. We can, uh, we can uh, link um, uh, schools mm. or small health facilities to electricity, which is totally changing the, the, the potential in terms of education, in terms of health and sanitation. But of course, as well, uh, we have many testimonies of people who are running, you know, micro, micro enterprises where they need just access to electricity to run meals to, or to um, sue or things like that. So the testimony are numerous, numerous. I think in uh, Upper West, linked to the feeder roads, there are even more people uh, that I've met. I have met first-hand associations of women who are harvesting some product and they tell me this last year we have lost so and so and this year we will be able to sell this, this, this and with the product, with the revenues that they are generating, they are already investing in um, new crops. So there again, they are uh, real uh, good stories, personal stories. So it's a uh, life changing. Life changing. Um... Very interesting. Thank you for sharing. But from there, let's let's segue into security-related mm -hmm. matters. And of course, uh, 
wherever you look across the continent of Africa, <laughs> especially post COVID nineteen, there have been uh, security related um, issues, developments, even following the Jasmine Revolution in Tunisia and everything in between. But currently, the southern belt of Africa has its own issues. East Africa, Kenya has had its own issues. When it comes to the West African region as well, there's been quite a bit of turbulence and military escapades into um, you know, governance. We can point to Mali, Burkina Faso, um, Guinea, Niger, and all of these. When you look at the security landscape in the West African sub-region, what do you see? What do I see? What do you see? No, I see uh, challenges in the region, and this is the region wh reason why we are working together hand in hand with Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Togo, uh, in order to ensure that the fragilities uh, or the vulnerabilities inside and outside those countries are not played out in order to, um, to prevent potential you know, a spillover uh, in terms of insecurity. And in Ghana, for example, as you know, we have um, late last year handed over 105 militarized vehicles mm -hmm. precisely to reinforce the capacities of the Ghanaian armed forces to patrol the borders and to do their job in terms of prevention. So this is, I would say, um, a big undertaking, a first one, because this will be followed by over handing over equ equipment, which are critical in terms of um, surveillance, intelligence gathering, communication, because you know when you are in the west side of uh, Ghana, you, you need to ascertain what's happening in the eastern side. You need communication, secure communication, reliable communication interoperable communication. So this is the reason why we have, I would say, a regional approach to that. So uh, this work is ongoing. Another big undertaking that is less visible is uh, the undertaking on maritime security. Right. Because um, insecurity happened a lot in the Gulf of Guinea, linked to piracy, linked to uh, robbery. And since the European member states' navies are patrolling in the region, there was a decrease by 90, almost 90% 90 mm -hmm. of the incidence of piracy. And as we speak, there are permanent presence there, which is what we call a common maritime presence. Of course, this is fully linked uh, to the Ghanaian Navy, mm -hmm. and we will help the Ghanaian Navy get revamping their uh, vessels as well. So this is a cooperation which is um, fully benefiting uh, the national apparatus. And you might have seen that we have been handing over on a regular basis equipment for the Ghana Immigration Service. I will do another batch soon because they are in the front line at the borders. They have, you know, to... They have to be mobile, so they need uh, motorbikes, they, they have what they communication. Have they need modern IT uh, outlets in order, you know, like at the, at the airport, mm. to scan the identities of people who are going out in, so on and so forth. So this is a large undertaking, and the key drive is to support and to reinforce the national capabilities. Speaking of those national capabilities, I just want to draw you back. And fantastic work you're doing on the maritime front and all of that. We have a boundary commission <laughs> that focuses on land. And, of and course, at when sea it comes as well. To, at sea as well. Yes, yes. but they, they, they are pretty limited. I've had I interactions with them when it comes to sea. And that is where you come in with this support. And of course, I have followed with keen interest how piracy activities in our maritime waters and beyond have decreased. Even there was a time where Somali piracy became a thing leading into our waters. Exactly, but, exactly. But that, that has diminished. I've followed um, those stories. But I'd like to find out in ECOWAS, because it's not just Ghana. Ghana's security feeds into other countries' security, and theirs feeds into ours. Um, three of those countries I mentioned earlier, which have fallen 
to coup d'etats are opting out of ECOWAS. They are in the process of, they have reiterated very recently their call to opt out of ECOWAS. You know the dynamics in there. Um, and then you look at some of these countries and there's a case of regime security versus the reality of human security. Are these areas that you, you're contemplating, are these areas that you collaborate with our government on in terms of that security? Because of course, like we saw in Kenya, if the human security is lagging, regime security will not save the situation. So what's, what's your approach to that? What's your thinking? No, once again, we approach the regional security where, it, um, where the remit is, and the remit is ECOWAS. So we are supporting heavily ECOWAS as an institution. You know, the mandate of ECOWAS is huge. Agriculture, transportation, mm. infrastructure, regional security, peace and security, so on and so forth. So our, I would say, baseline is to support politically, financially, ECOWAS if needed. Uh, but the work that we are undertaking with the Ghana, Ghanaian authorities, once again, is fitting the national priorities. If the national priorities is dictating cooperation, working with any given countries in the region, mm. that's good. We are supporting the national strategy. You have a national security strategy mm -hmm. of 2020. I think this was one of the first documents I've read when I arrived, I see. which is in the, uh, I would say, uh, process of being updated. We are supporting this update, not in oh, terms of are. content, but in okay. terms of helping for the reach out, etc. <laughs> but you know, this is our rational. The rationale is what do you believe is the priority you need to address and to follow? We have, do we have a joint interest in pursuing that? Yes, of course, we have a joint interest in making Ghana still a secure, safe country, the same for Cote d'Ivoire, for Togo, for Bena. So we have a shared interest in working in those areas. Well, a shared interest, of course, in peace and, and security. Which, which brings me to my next question in terms of the human security mm -hmm. angle. Jobs, youth unemployment. I'm sure you're familiar with the statistics. Recently, um, the Ghana Statistical Service came through with further details or further data on multidimensional poverty, mm -hmm. people who are poor in terms of education, who are poor in terms of work, they don't have work, who are poor in terms of finances. Obviously, if you don't have an education, you don't have work, you will likely not have much money. Who are poor in terms of health, because you will need some money to get proper health, and it goes on and on. The unemployment rates have gone pretty high, uh, pretty much doubled since 2016, 2017, thereabouts. What has the European Union in Ghana done in terms of these areas? How concerned are you, first of all, and what have you done in this respect? No, seeing the um, uh, degradation of the statistics is an issue of um, concern, and beyond the statistics, it's about the lives of uh, real people. So I think it's uh, an important undertaking, and as I said, one of the key priority, this is the reason why one of the key priority is still and mostly will be support for job creation. But you can do that much because one of our flagship projects that we had before we just finished, which is we call it the Green Project, mm. has created tens of thousands of jobs, which is great. But the challenge ahead of us, because I put ourselves, I would say, in this joint undertaking, as I've mentioned, there are 400,000 youths who are entering the job market everywhere. So it's not only the European Union, there are other partners which are supporting and which are, I would say, fitting into national strategies. Mm. We are supporting young entrepreneurs. We are supporting the socioeconomic inclusion of women. We have done great. I see. We I'm have particularly done great. interested in anything supporting women, so let's, we have let's done focus great. a bit on that. We have done great in agriculture, okay. in small entrepreneurship, okay. 
Um, where indeed you will find a lot of women. Um, in, um, you know, the she butter uh, industry, yes. which sure. can absorb a large range of uh, women because this is a sector which is largely women driven. Mm. But it's not just to give you something to pick up the, uh, the, 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 nuts. the nuts. You have to transform that, you have to package them, and the European Union, being the European, we are eager mm. to have you sell your product in the European market, which is not an easy thing to do because there are, um, I would say, strict regulation when it comes to a product you put on your skin or you eat, etc. And there we have specific programs to help, and it was quite successful, a large range of small entrepreneurs in the cosmetic industries to make it to the European market. So these are I would say good stories, but as I said, compared to the magnitude of the challenge, this is something which demonstrates it works, mm. but uh, needs as well, you know, a conducive uh, environment. We all know the economic crisis is taken a toll, not only in Ghana, and uh, this is one of the key, I would say, uh, achievement which have to be salvaged and push forward and you know the economy fortunately is bouncing back and this is a reason for optimism and hopefully to uh, accelerate uh, once again job creation. You got me smiling when you said the economy was bouncing back um, maybe later we'll have a conversation on that. <laughs> um, um, some optimism is good of course but uh, just on the point you made about <coughs> shea nuts and uh, the shea butter and all of that, I know farmers personally in that. I also know some, I have friends who are into cosmetics, who use, who go up north, purchase and all that. You would realize that there are lots of women up north mm -hmm. involved in this, but the process is so rudimentary. It is still very yeah. basic. I've tried myself with the hands, you have to... Very basic, yeah, yeah. and if, if they could just get some more mechanization mm. to the process, it would be more rapid, it would be more humane, they could earn more, it, it, since you've noticed that already. Is but that this is precisely what we are doing. This is precisely what we are doing. What we are doing is to roll out everything possible to support industrialization. Mm. Industrialization can come in the form of, uh, you know, these simple machine which are helping or avoiding you the hassle of doing this type of thing uh, yourself. We are supporting cooperatives of women. Some of the cooperatives of North are covering 1,500 women. True. Not everyone will have the machine. Mm. They give the machine to the cooperative, everyone can bring the nuts. And use the machine and use the machine. So this is something which was very successful and uh, on which we, we believe it, uh, it is um, relevant to, to build and to, I would say, duplicate, scale up. And not everyone is at the same level. You know, I've seen in the same day in Tamale, a woman is with pressing one soap at a time, one soap at a time. Neighboring a woman who is pressing six soaps at a time, and then, as I said, uh, meeting an association of cooperatives with a much larger, I would say, processing power. And of course, the, the beauty of the project is to try to, to put everyone uh, together to bring them at the same level of, uh, of production and output. Oh, I see. Let's look at culture now, and maybe language. Um, I mean, you would, you would look at Africa and in some countries, depending on whether they are Anglophone, Francophone, Lusophone, and others, you would find the BBC more prominent in certain places, RFE, uh, you would find L'Alliance Francaise, you would find Goethe Institut, among others. And it's because of soft power. And, and what it can do in the minds of people. Hollywood is big because it's also a form of soft power. How do you feel that has been developed 
in Ghana per our culture? And what more do you think could be done in that regard? I mean, European culture in Africa, yes, but Ghanaian culture, what can be made of it in terms of soft power? I mean, you have a great um, uh, film industry, film schools, you have a great film platform that we are supporting on a regular basis. Okay. Uh, so, so there's NAFTI, there's... Yes, the yes, world, um, yes. And, um, you know, the Black Star Film Festival and yes. so on, so, which is a huge event. Yeah. Uh, and what is important, it's not to keep it in Ghana. It's to showcase it elsewhere, like European cultural product can be showcased here. Uh, Ghanaian uh, cultural products are showcased elsewhere. So, for example, we have supported some um, um, filmmakers to make it even to the Cannes Festival or to other worldwide okay. festival. So, yes, this is an area where we pay a lot of attention, especially, as you've mentioned, this is a country which has great, I would say, homegrown product when it comes to music, movies, uh, weaving, so on and so forth. So, this is not a difficult one to do. And this is something which is, I would say, for us, is a no-brainer because we believe in um, uh, intercultural dialogue. This is the reason why we are organizing now and again what we call fusion, fusion of artists between Ghanaian artists, uh, artists coming from Togo, Bena, elsewhere in the region, Europeans, to do joint productions, so on and so forth. So yes, this is something not only we believe in, but uh, where we are putting our money where our mouth is. You're putting your money where your mouth is. Yes. It's not just talk, you're walking the talk. No. All right. That's, that's, that's definitely a good thing. But having said that, um, this comes to mind. There are those who say, yes, you're putting your money where your mouth is, but it's because of interest, your interest. I mean, there always is interest. But how much interest is too much interest? And I'll give you a typical example. I, I hosted the last Ghana Statistical Service Multidimensional Poverty Index, which I was just talking to you about. And some people there, researchers, share, for example, oh, I wanted research on maybe oranges to boost Ghanaian production and cultivate varieties that are more sturdy and can survive in Ghana. But I don't have research sponsorship. But guess what? The EU or some outfit in the US wants to sponsor me, but they want me to do something else. For because example? it is, for example, they want me to research into okra mm -hmm. or cocoa, because it is, you, you know how much uh, chocolate the European Union mm -hmm. consumes, but a lot of which comes from this is private Ghana, research. Cote d'Ivoire and all mm. of that. Uh, this is private research. Well, so it it's is not uh, in the national interest. But some, some would no, say, but it's market driven. It's market driven. Uh, yeah. You could say that. But the question then I am is, saying with, that, with yeah. all of these things that are being done, how much of general interest is in there? How much of I'm trying to look for the right word, narrow interests are in there. For those who will say... And but in which field? There. Because now I'm lost. You are speaking of okra and orange. Ag agriculture and, was just, was just and an movies. example. movies. So you are putting apples and pears no, literally no, together. No, no. So I mean, what is the question? Agriculture exactly? was just an example. Some would say the work of the European Union in Africa is in European interest solely. Would that be a correct statement? And if not... Solely, no. Uh, we are working as well like everyone. Ghana is working in Europe for Ghanaian interests. Mm. Sorry to tell. No, it's I a mean, huge... I, I, started, it's, I know it's I a huge scoop. Premise. <laughs> I know it's a huge scoop. But <laughs> if you are sending a Ghanaian ambassador to Brussels, of course, it's to defend of the Ghanaian interest. But there is another scoop for you. Okay, can no. you well, listen? The first one wasn't, I, listen, I wouldn't say it was listen, a scoop, but you know, this is yeah. another groundbreaking scoop. Tell me about it. I hope you are well seated. <laughs> there, is a broad, the ground. there is a broad range of what we call shared interest. Okay. Okay? The more 
the more you meet the requirements on selling cocoa to Europe, the mm. more cocoa you will sell to Europe. This is playing in Ghana's interest. And the more cocoa we will be able to transform into chocolate. This is in the interest of the customers. Look at that. Ha! <laughs> Look at that! I like, I Look like the at way that. you went. Of course, Europe Look has at a, that. an almost insatiable appetite for, no, no, for I'm, chocolate. And I'm oh, precisely, where will you get it from? Yeah. I'm precisely taking this example because there were these total stupid stories that the European Union you know, wants to ban cocoa, right. uh, Ghanaian cocoa. First and foremost, Ghana is not the only cocoa country in the world. Right. You have your neighbors on uh, the west side. Mm -hmm. You have the cocoa producers in uh, Latin America, so on and so forth. But can you fathom that? Europe is the first market of Ghanaian cocoa. Why on earth would we close it? I mean, people are craving for chocolate. I mean, I'm not that much myself into chocolate, but people are into chocolate. This is fact of life. Why would you shoot ourselves in the foot and say, no more chocolate from Ghana? Well, the you... reality, too, is no, that no, no, on, the so, of, on the back no, no, of Galamse so, activities. Yes, but this is not the story. Uh, the, story the story is, this is precisely what we call a shared interest. You sell more cocoa of better quality, we mm. buy more, and we have chocolate. And these examples, not only linked to trade, because interests are not narrow uh, based on money. As I said, security is a shared interest. I don't think uh, anyone would be happy to see Ghana stumbling down. Not in Europe, not in Ghana. So our shared interest is to ensure the stability or support the national authority to ensure the stability of the country. And examples like that are many, many, many. And thinking of it, I'm trying to, on an honest basis, try to find something that we are doing purely on uh, European interest. Maybe we will need to have a new program to, to find that, but I don't see examples of things that we are doing solely in our interest. Solely in our interest. I mean, that question was just so. No, no, I mean, there are some it's an interesting one. It's an interesting who, one. Who definitely uh, pose these questions or reflect yes. on these matters. And I hope I have answered their hopefully, question. Hopefully. And I'm happy to take follow up questions on that next time we meet. Uh, how concerned are you, though, about the dips in cocoa production in Ghana? I mean, we've, we've spoken mm. about this before, but you know that Ghana's production has dipped. Quite a bit yeah, yeah. in recent but times. Uh, I, yeah, I have the same concerns as the Ghanaian players mm. for many reasons. First reason, back to another interest, which is a shared interest. Less cocoa means less revenue. Less revenue means more poverty. Mm. Poverty in Africa is not playing in our interest. We are neighbors. Mm. We are neighbors. Poverty of your neighbors is not playing in your interest. I don't want you to live in a neighborhood where you are the rich man amongst uh, poor people. Second area of concern is less cocoa production means scarcity of the, project, pro, pro, uh, the product. Scarcity of the product, I'm not a big economist, but prices are, are picking up. So we, we have the same concerns. And uh, of course, you've mentioned the Galamse. It seems that on top of climate change, on top of um, uh, diseases that have affected a large number of um, uh, plantations. Uh, Galam say it's taking the toll as well on, you know, use of land. And, you know, there is a competition in the use of land, whether you cultivate, whether you have cattle, whether you, you know, you dig holes to, to find gold. It's interesting the way you just put it, wherever you dig a hole to find, yeah, to find gold. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I see. As we wind down on the conversation, uh, just a few uh, lighter bits I want us to take a look at. What are some of the challenges you have faced in your work in, in Ghana? And I know you do tour the sub-region a bit. What are some of the challenges you have encountered in Ghana and externally that you think uh, the European Union could 
be more collaborative on? And what are some of the challenges that we ourselves in West Africa should be tackling? One of the challenges that really strikes me is, um, I would say, the state of interconnectivity between mm. the countries. Mm. Because we, for sure, the European Union, we have funded on many occasions the famous, what we call, strategic corridor from Mauritania to Lagos. Mm. From Mauritania to Lagos. I'm not speaking about a flower only. And the uh, fact of life is the corridor is not that effective, especially when uh, we enter the Gulf of Guinea. So this is something which strikes me. And this is for me a key challenge because, you know, connectivity dictates the competitiveness. We have, as the European, at least three of our member states, invested a lot in the Tema port. You might have visited that. To the extent that Tema is one of, if not the, most efficient port in Africa, at least to manage the containers. Okay? And this makes sense if the rest of the connectivity comes to place. But it means that it is possible. And secondly, that there is still more work to be done. And then we are happy to join hands to, to, to you know, it's not the European Union which will be able to address that alone. It's a matter of, you know, joining hands with multiple Definitely. partners and with um, governance which is, I would say, uh, creating the conducive um, environment for that. All right. As we wrap off, um, are you a fan of football? I should not say that because, you know, the second religion is this country is football. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, really, uh, some of my colleagues are desperate because we are um, share say names of uh, players. I don't even know if they are... Uh, you know, French or Italian or Argentinian or whatever, maybe Ghanaians. Mm. I know the player Abdul Kudus, no, Kudus. Mohamed Kudus. Mohamed Kudus. Mm. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not so good. I should not say this type of things on because people will be really disappointed in me. But I cannot fake it because if you are asking me question on food, ask no, me your question. No, you have to be real. I mean, the, the Copa America ask the question. is going on. Ask, ask Argentina, the I believe, is marching to the finals. Not that I'm so happy about that. Which um, one? Argentina. Is, is I, I thought it was the Euro. The finals. Argentina. I, I, I was going to talk about the Copa America is taking place. Uh, Euro America. 2024 is taking place. I was actually going to ask you about whether you felt any of the teams. Uh, yesterday, Spain dumped England. And um, are you I are, know Spain. Are you, are, you are almost as bad as me Spain. because <laughs> <laughs> you are almost as bad as me. <laughs> England will be playing, I think, the Netherlands. Okay. And uh, Spain. This I know. This I know. Uh, which, uh, France. Yes. yes. This Mbappe. I know. This I know. Well, that you know. That you okay, know. so that you know. That you and know. I was going to ask you. Uh, wait, you're Malagasy. Yeah, as well. Yes. Okay, as well. So in Europe, which which country do you? I'm from France, yes. Okay, so... Um, hmm. yeah, yesterday was not a good day for much. French <laughs> It was not a good day for French football, yes. Uh, so are you, like we'll say in Ghana, are you bleeding? It Do you know what that means when... when I can imagine, I can imagine. You know I'm doing boxing, so I can imagine. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yes, it's fact of life. And I'm not sure the team was playing at its best. It wasn't... I mean, Mbappe had, had not scored, I think, throughout the tour tournament. And then he got the knock and everything. But, no. well... Um, I think it was a fair outcome. It was a fair outcome. Okay. You have to we'll put fairness where fairness is due. Yeah, we'll see what Le Bleu will do uh, come the next uh, tournament. But, but to cap it off, before I take your final words, Ghana is at the door of another election. Mm -hmm. This is a crucial election, and the stakes are high. What is the EU doing to ensure, especially in light of all the turbulence in the sub-region, to ensure not just peace, but also free, fair, transparent elections. I know you have your observer unions and your observer groups and all that, but what can we expect 
from the European Union as far as our elections are concerned? I would say with the same uh, rationale and same logics as the rest of the interventions that we have here, we are supporting the national institutions vested in the organization, follow up, maybe even the settlement of the elections. So in clear, we are uh, working together with the um, electoral commission and other bodies which are very important. The NCC. NCC, National uh, Commission, Commission for Civic, Civic Education, Education, for awareness raising, prevention of violence linked to pre-post-electoral uh, violence, a National Peace Committee. And this time around, I think this is very important to, um, to share it uh, because you know, there is a well-established, I would say, tradition and practice of democracy over the last um, uh, 30 years. We will not uh, display a large observation mission, but we will display what we call experience. But instead of that, we will support, meaning funding, a national observers, because we are, we are of the belief that uh, it is important that the national apparatus and the national institution are equipped and reinforced to do what we are supposed to do, and not that it comes from outside. So this is the, the very idea. We, you know, we are working together with other partners and with the government and these bodies uh, in order to make sure, at least to support them in the implementation of their mandate. So here we are, the conclusion of this uh, discussion. Over to you, Your Excellency. Final words? Final words, I think we... Um, we have uh, had a very in-depth conversation that we can dig even uh, more next time. Mm -hmm. But it illustrates the fact that um, the European Union is uh, here to stay. We invest in the future of Ghana. We believe in Ghana. We believe in the future of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, once again the reason why we are so committed on youth, job creation, stability, transparency, sustainability. So every stream of our commitment, you can open all the drawers. I'm pretty sure you will find, I would say, a great deal of uh, shared commitment, shared interests. So thank you very much for the program. Thank you too. That was a very interesting conversation, but let's turn our focus now to bad roads. Residents of Tema, Community 25, Boom, Pram Pram, Gulf City, and those who ply the Tema to Aflau Road will tomorrow stage a massive demonstration over the deplorable state of the Ala Road. The aggrieved residents are demanding the immediate return of the contractor working on the road, as they say the stall expansion project is not just causing long gridlock, but adversely impacting their health. Joining me now on Zoom is the Assembly Member for Mlichakpo, Electoral Area, Isaac Newton Tete. Isaac, and I know we brought you this story about a week ago or a month ago, I think. But tell us, what specific areas or which specific sides of the roads are in question? Well, thank you very much for your time and the opportunity as well. The road we're talking about is the 17-kilometer uh, stretch of road from the um, Tema runabout to Miocho. You know, this road is a very important road for this country because it's connect people from, let's say, Nigeria, Togo, Benin, mm. Ada, Aflao, Pram Pram, heading towards Accra. And it's very important, especially when you, you, are, you are using this road by the by of the day, the traffic on the road is really unbearable. And, you know, BHM, I'm told, want the B to construct the road. They started something uh, last two years, but for some time now, they are not on the, on, on the site. And our call for tomorrow's demonstration is just to ensure that government brings back BHM to continue with the work because the inconveniences residents must go through when going to work or wherever where, where they want to go is, is so much unbearable. So our, our plea is just to ensure that uh, BHM is brought on site to continue with the work. 
to make it more trouble for the, the, the residents within the enclave. Right, and I recall that during that time we brought that story to you, our audience, we, there was a young lady talking about her health, her eyes, and she can't breathe well. But you tell me, how exactly does these roads affect your health? Well, you know, when roads are being constructed and then they are not done, uh, it has a lot of, I mean, uh, inconveniences that it creates. You know, though some of them are asthmatic already, so the dusty nature of the road, I mean, compounds the, 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 their conditions, and then it, it really affects them. Some, there are, there are some who are also food vendors. So this same dusty stuff, mm. I, mean, uh, I mean, affects the, 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 the stuff that they sell. And residents or, or on, uh, I mean, suspected residents go buy those things, and then they are, they are also in trouble. So uh, when, when the rules are cut, we believe that the dust will really come down, and then it will make goods or, or, or services there very comfortable, very consumable for the residents. So our, our, our call, again, is just tomorrow is going to be a peaceful demonstration, mm. and uh, we're just going to I mean, draw the attention of leadership. That is indeed, uh, the road has been neglected for a very long time. You know, this road that we're talking about also connects uh, uh, people from Kufubi are coming to Accra. Sometimes when there's a great lock on the Meshekam Road, they have to mm. detour two through uh, uh, 25 to the uh, Kumbara Road. And right. it makes um, I mean, movement very simple. But it has been neglected for all this while. And when it rains, Adam, it's, it's not easy. It's not right. easy at all. So we need, we need some attention on that very road tomorrow. And that, that's why we are going to demonstrate to ensure that that road is given the needed attention that it deserves. And Isaac, in the letter I saw that you released, you mentioned that all preparations were in place, which means I'm sure you've checked with security personnel and all that. But so tell me, what exactly are your key demands and when is the demonstration? You can tell me when you're start, where you're starting from and where you'll be ending. Well, tomorrow we're all converging at the Bombaria enclave. Mm. I mean, uh, because tomorrow we have a national assignment because the BC students are writing and, and just close to where we converge is a centre. So we, we, we are going to notify the police that we would hold on for a little bit when the student goes into their hall and then every, everybody is cleared, then we are good to go. So we, we, are in, we are in constant communication with the police and they've also given us the assurance that indeed they will come there to ensure that everything is, I mean, uh, uh, organized in, 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 in a well manner. So uh, the road we are talking about is the Pumbaria to Mutual. That enclave. If you if you use this that road on daily basis, you would see what the, the impact of what I'm trying to say. Mm. The the traffic on that road alone, if you're going to Accra or you're coming from Accra, is it's, it's unbearable. Look at the cost of fuel these days, and right. uh, drivers would have to wait in car in traffic for two three hours before they they, they move from that enclave. And then it's it, it's really not helping. It, it, it's affecting productivity, and we we need to get this thing done and then ensure that. Yes, indeed, we are, we are in, in, in good health. And we understand some people from Pampram, Pong, and Ada are also joining the cause. Exactly. All concerned residents. Actually, the, the organizers are rather even coming from uh, uh, Dawinya, Dawinya, okay. Pampram, and then with those in Pong, Katamansu, that Pumbara area, we're going to support this I mean, move to ensure that, yes, indeed, this thing I mean, is given the uh, needed attention. Because if you use that stretch of the road, this should be of a serious concern to you. And uh, I mean, everybody should come on board, whether you are in government, you are out of government, whether you, you are a pastor, I mean, imam, where, whoever you are, if you really you are concerned with the nature of the road as it is now, you need to come on board, let's all join hands, and then and, and, and tell government that it is indeed, we also deserve better. You see, what I foresee over this time is that uh, the residents, we are not hungry enough. Mm. Because things are falling apart, and it's like we are all not con concerned. Yes, and uh, sharply too, we are divided on political lines. So when you are calling for certain things, people try to read for political minutes into it. But we, we want to tell them that when the rules are done, it's, it's done for all of us to use. Yeah. And it's not for any political party or whoever is in power, whatever, whatever it is. This is where they all pass it to their campaigns. And then we need to get them uh, 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 know that, yes, indeed, our rules deserve better surface that than what we are, we are seeing now. So we are calling on everybody, the taxi drivers, the, the, the food vendors, uh, the businesses on the stretch of the road. You know that some of the uh, companies on that stretch of the road have been earmarked for demolition. Mm -hmm. And some too have been given their compensation, but they are still there. So it's, it's, it raises serious concerns that right. yes, 
Are we just using knee jerk approaches to solving this problem? We need to get the road. I mean, fix this is about 70 kilometers of road. The yeah. last time we had a stakeholders meeting, mm -hmm. we were told it's six lanes out and six lanes in with service lines. So we are expecting, I mean, a modern road, not what we've seen. So we are calling on the government to tell BHM, they are those in charge of the construction. They already have their offices here. Right. So I don't know what is keeping them from coming. They, they have to visit site and then I mean, start with the work again. And I can tell you something, let me mm. check in this information to you. You see, uh, we have a community called Saki. And this community, the, the road there to, I mean, it's so bad because that road is a trunk road that connects the N1 and then the N2. Right. You understand? So when 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 we are when they started with the uh, interchange at the Pumbaria, we all knew that okay, they will pay attention to that stretch of the road because when the N1 is took, people want to detour through Saki to the N2 to make it motor, but that, that one too is very bad. And just last two months, a contractor came to site to do some COVID. I mean, some uh, two two by three point right. five meter COVID. And as I speak to now, he has also vacated the site. He has excavated only the two so lanes. So those, those are your demands, right, Isaac? That the contractors should return to the work so that the roads can be completed. Those are your demands exactly for tomorrow. That. All that's, right. That's our demand. That we are all right. For. All the best tomorrow. And I hope that all those listening and are interested all use that road should show out tomorrow and support the cause. Isaac Newton Tete is Assemblyman for Mlichapu Electoral Area. Isaac, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. Thank you very much, dear. All right, but before we take a break, we are the Multimedia Group are proud to announce that we are the official free-to-air radio broadcast rights owners of the Euro 2024. And we've been delivering live commentary of selected games, including the opening game, and we will deliver on the finals too with our team of talented commentators and analysts on Joy FM, Love FM, Hits FM, Adum FM, Inshira FM, and Asempa FM. And apart from the live radio commentary, we have also been curating custom Euro 2024 shows on radio, TV, and digital, as well as live viewing events, all aimed at delivering unparalleled experience of the competition to you, our cherished audience. And the multimedia group's radio broadcast coverage of the Euro 2024 tournament is courtesy of Spotty TV and Spotty Bit. So watch selected matches of Euro 2024 live on Spotty TV channel 36 on your digital TV set. Now we'll take a break. We'll return with a conversation on the Joy FM Ecobank Habitat Fair. We'll be right back. Um, thanks for staying with us. And now let's talk about the Joy News Ecobank Habitat Fair. And in the build-up to the major fair, we know we've been bringing you interviews with the major sponsors of this program. And today, in the studio with me is James Kwekusenu, and he's um, the manager, sales and marketing manager for DBS Industries Limited. James, it's good to have you in the studio. And I know DBS is into roofing, but you tell me, what does DBS um, Solutions do? So DBS Industries is one of the leading manufacturers that produces quality but affordable roofing sheet. And we have the steel trusses and we have that, we have that, that diversify into our concrete product being the ready mix concrete. We have the pavement blocks, we have the pavement caps, and we have the pavement, we have the interlock system. So let me touch on a little bit on yes, the, roofing, on the yeah. roofing side. So the roofing side, we have a, a self-lock material. That self-lock material has a male and a female, which has a self-interlocking system. So the name was derived from that material. So the material yeah. locks itself. So okay. we have self-lock, we have the IBL, we have the IDT, we have shingles, we have bureau towels, and we also have the steel trusses. Everything roofing. We have everything roofing. Is that all you do? Yes, uh, currently. Concrete? Yeah, You're concrete. just telling yeah, me about yeah, concrete yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. We, have, we have concrete products, being the ready mix concrete. So we are urging our people to stop the manual way of missing concrete. Okay. So that we go, we have a mobile plant whereby you come with your estimate, you give an estimate, then we the estimate to determine the volumes that you want. Then we can do that production based on your volumes. Then we just come to your site and just come and pour your concrete. Yeah. We have a shooter as well, which we can pour to any floors or heights wherever you want. Yeah. Okay. 
And I know for a fact that this is not the first time you're sponsoring the EcoBank Habitat Fair. In fact, how long have you been sponsoring us and why are you back here again this year? It must be something interesting. Actually, I've, I've been with DBS. This is my ninth year now. And okay. since I joined DBS, and I, I know we have been sponsoring. It's a, a yearly. Yes, this is the yearly, 18th time year, we're doing uh, yeah. this. So I think since, since my ninth year, we are still, uh, still sponsoring. And you know, there's a housing deficit. So yeah. we always come on board to contribute our quota yeah. just to reduce this housing mm. deficit. So what should, what should our audience or participants expect this time from DBS Limited? So uh, this time is, we have a very juicy package compared to the PUS. We have a very juicy package for them. We are giving them a discount. I don't want to disclose the discount oh, here. Please tell us. We are, <laughs> we are giving a discount of 10%. Okay. And I saw, I saw that you are giving a, a, a DBS branded uh, seven years. Okay. Yeah, being a, a key holder, a mug, and a shirt here. Okay. Yeah. But before we go, how do we contact you? In case someone wants to reach out to you, even before the fair, how do we contact you and where are you located? So DBS, we are in five regions in Ghana. We are in Accra, we are in Kumasi, we are in Takrade, we are in Sunyane, we are in Tamale. So for the Accra, we are very close to Papa here. So you can contact us on... 0240 In Kumasi, it's 050 600 And we are also in Takrade, 050 hmm. Okay, you are here, so I'll give you some seconds to invite audience to come on board and you know experience you and the entire fair so please so i just want to urge audience this from tomorrow to sunday will be at tema the the municipal assembly will be there with our with our branded materials with a sample of our sheets sample of our, our products so we urge all of them to come and enjoy our juicy package we have for them just to reduce the housing deficits that right. we have and Thank they can you. also log to on our facebook it's right. dbsghana.com and Instagram as well. And they can also log on to our website, www.dbsghana.com for any further information. James Senu is the managing Marketing and Sales Manager at DBS Industries Limited. Thank you so much for coming. Thank and you, you do know that me. this is the second clinic we're having. The first one was at Achmota Mall. It was a mini clinic. And now we are going to Tema. So if you missed the first one, this is your chance to join us again for another exciting edition of the EcoBank Join News Habitat Fair. But before we go, this is an invitation to escape to Royal Cozy Hills Hotel. That is a Drapa Dubai. You have seen the rest, now it's time to see the best. Take a break from work and take a break from the south. The Royal Cozy Hills Hotel is the best place to relax, rewind and re-energize. It is away from the stress of the south. And what awaits you at Drapa Dubai? Unforgettable safari experience, amazing array of wildlife, including lions, hippopotamuses, zebras, ostriches, all that you need to see using their spacious and well-secured game tour vehicles or quad bikes. There's also water sports, such as jet skiing and boats and canoe rides, etc. There is various family games to keep you and your families excited all day long, as well as great tourist attractions in the Upper West region, including the Mushroom Rock and the Slave Cave, among others. So, escape from the south, escape to the north, escape to Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, the Drapa Dubai, for an unforgettable safari experience. And you can call them on 050-169-4280 or 24 8844463 for reservations and further inquiries. And that's it for... Royal Cozy Hills Hotel. My name is Sweetie Abochi, and I did this with Benjamin Akaku. We are back on your screens tomorrow with the Friday edition of the AM Show. Always look out for Benjamin Akaku's blunt thoughts and many conversations here on the AM Show. We are back tomorrow, but up next is Join News Desk with Faustina Safo.